Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. RacismDaily.com, your number one source for global news reports on race, racism, and overt actions of white supremacy. From Asia to the Americas to Europe to Australia to Africa, racism is not a thing of the past. It is our current reality. Be informed. Be globally informed. You should be the first to know. RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? Racism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter racist logic, even counter racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Do you need a one-stop shop for all of your multimedia needs? Triumphant Multimedia is a skilled team of professionals with a passion for great marketing and chic design. Our specialties include consulting, brand development, copywriting, and creative graphic design that's second to none. We also offer photography, photo retouching, videography, and video editing. At Triumphant Multimedia, our goal is to provide highly effective creative solutions built to suit any individual need or budget. Give us a call at 678-732-8067 or check us out online at TRI Multimedia. Multimedia.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the couch. This is Justice here at TalkShoe. If you want to learn, listen, understand a question, go to TalkShoe.com. And in the search box, type in context of white supremacy. And then click the second box down below. And then it'll take you right to it. For more information on racism and white supremacy, go to my blog. Just do justicetoday.blogspot.com. And my email address is justice.rwswj at gmail.com. Replace white supremacy with justice. ASAP. You're just saying just buckets and buckets of words. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade and Justice in for another program to share constructive information on the system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning into the program. I uh, hope you get constructive uh, information. Uh, I'm really grateful uh, to have the opportunity to do uh, the program today. Uh, fortunate to have a guest on the program whose work had a uh, huge influence uh, on my understanding of racism, white supremacy, uh, back when I was very confused uh, about what's happening on the planet and who is to blame for what is happening on the planet. Um, I think the first book that I read of his was Decolonizing the African Mind and uh, just Fantastic reading. Uh, it's one of my top books all time. I would highly recommend it to uh, any non-white people anywhere on the planet uh, to help their understanding of white supremacy. Uh, then read uh, the rest and the uh, the West 
and the rest of us. Um, and uh, again, just incredible information. It really helped me get a very clear picture of uh, exactly what the problem is, and that problem is white people. Um, again, as I said, super privileged uh, to have him on the program to discuss his work, uh, hear information about what's going on in Libya, and uh, hopefully more folks um, will uh, check out some of his writing. Uh, it's just, as I said, I cannot... Uh, Cannot recognize it enough for how it helped my clarity and becoming less confused. Uh, joining us live from Ghana, uh, Dr. Chinwizu. Uh, Dr. Chinwizu, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for sharing a bit of your time with us. We are really grateful uh, for the opportunity to hear some of your views. Um, I know some of my uh, listeners that are in the states. Um, they might this might be their first time uh, hearing from you. Um, could you give them just a little bit of background information so they'll have a better idea of who you are and the work that you do? <coughs> my name is Chinwezu. I'm a Nigerian, and I, I mean, I, I mean, what what we call a black power pan Africanist, and. Uh, my concern is with um, getting black people to understand their situation in the world and where they are heading and what they have to do if they intend to survive in the world as it is. So black power and Africanism goes back to Gavi and takes its um, bearings from what Gavi taught us about our place in the world and what we must do. This is a brand of pan Africanism that is diametrically opposed to continentalist pan-Africanism that Nkrumah sponsored, that has kept us backward for the last 50 years. Well, what I do most of the time is um, write things that challenge the conditions in which we are, and also to help to liberate us from continentalist pan-Africanism and its mindset. We talk of liberation from imperialism and all that, but we also need to get back to the point of liberating our, ourselves from our own dogmas, doctrines that have not helped us have worsened our situation over the last 50 years. And this is one of my concerns, that we begin to understand why we've not made any progress in the last, any measurable or useful progress in the last 50 years. And some of the reasons have to do with our own mentality, the ideas we have adopted and treat as sacred that we all need to re-examine and criticize and find ways to improve upon. Thank you. Mm. Wow. Um, I want to try to cover as much uh, material as we can um, in the time that we have you. Um, this program, uh, the context of white supremacy, uh, I have unfortunately concluded that we are in a global system of racism, white supremacy. Um, I use those two terms as synonyms, uh, and I use the same definition for both terms. Uh, that definition is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you believe that such a system exists, and do you think that definition is accurate? <clears throat> well, I'll have to reflect on that definition, but I think in off the bat, I would say yes. There is a system that um, for the last 500 years at least has approached the world with the view that the whites, particularly those of Europe, should dominate the world, to conquer and exploit the world, and uh, turn the, the rest of humanity into its servants and slaves. And it has done so literally. Physical, mental, economic slaves, political slaves, and that has been the system that was established since Columbus. It has its roots deeper than that, but the system finally came into being and attained global um, extent since the days of Columbus. Of course, that's the European side of it, but there is also an Arab side of it who did not establish a global um, domination the way that Europeans did. 
but the Arab side of it also believes in conquering the whole world, which is what the whole issue of jihad is about. Everybody who is not sub subjugated to the Arabs is regarded as fair game for war. So they talk of Islam as being peace, but it's only peace among the Muslim, among the, the converts, the conquered who have been converted to Arab domination through the religion of Islam. Everybody else is outside the pale and it's a target for jihad, which is a war of conquest. So there is an Arab side of the white supremacy game, which, which is even older than that of the Europeans. And then there is the European uh, brand of that game, which though younger, is has been more successful in that it, by the end of the 19th century it had imposed itself on the entire globe whereas the Arabs had not succeeded in doing so. And if anything, part of the problems we see today between, in the war between the West, uh, West, Western Europe and its diaspora and the Arabs is a continuation of, is, is, is derived from the fact that instead of conquering the world through their uh, bringing everybody under the religion of Islam, the Arabs got themselves conquered by the Europeans who took over the entire world. And part of what is going on is their resumption of their drive to reconquer the whole world. Like as they say, tell people they want to Arabize Africa and Islamize America. That is their, that's their target, that's the name of the ambition. It has been the ambition since Mohammed. So we've got two sides of the white supremacist game, the Arab side and the European side. And we in Africa are victims of the two of them, not just one. Uh, I was really eager to have you on the program to share your views on the conflict in Libya right now, because I think a lot of the issues that you just touched on, uh, so-called Arabs, and I, I think I've seen you reference them as white Arabs as well, um, you say that this conflict in Libya, this is not about... Uh, liberation of black people. This is not about concern for black people. This is something else entirely. And I wanted you to kind of share your view on what's happening in Libya and how that relates to uh, <clears throat> some of these ideas that are affli afflicting black people and preventing us from solving this problem of white supremacy. Well, the struggle in Libya is a war between the Euro Europeans, Western Europe, organized under NATO and the Arabs, the so-called Arab Spring, is part of that general conflict. Libya is part one particular battlefront in that war between the Europeans and the Arabs, and both are white peoples. The, 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 we are not part of the Arabs. We, the black Africans, we are not part of the Arabs. They don't see us as part of themselves, and we, if, we are, if our heads are correct, will not see us as part of the same team as the Arabs. The Arabs are colonialists and imperialists in Africa. So that part of Africa that they now occupy, they, uh, they invaded and conquered and they are white settlers from Algeria, from uh, Morocco to Egypt. So when, when these two enemies of ours, two, two, people, two white peoples, the Arabs and the Europeans, who have invaded, enslaved, conquered, and exploited us for hundreds of years, are fighting a war between themselves. That's none of our business if we are sensible. The two, our two enemies are at war, and it's none of our business to join with either of them or to support either of them. Our job is to take care of our own business, and we have plenty of that to take care of. But unfortunately, most, a lot of our leaders and our intellectuals are confused about the basic issues of the world and our basic position in the world, and are busy supporting one side or the other. And I guess the most outrageous is the, those of our leaders, like those in the AU and other and a lot of our intelligentsia, who think that the war between the Arabs and the Europeans in Libya is a war between Africa and Europe. It's obvious. Up, 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 it's fundamentally it is not. In practice, it is not. It's a war between Arabs who have settled in parts of conquered and settled in parts of Africa and the Europeans who have been their enemies for, for as long as uh, since the 7th century when the Arabs broke out of, out of the Arabian Peninsula and, and overran parts of the Roman Empire, Eastern Roman Empire. Their war has been going on since the 7th century. And this is just another episode in a long war. 
and it's none of our business. Both of them have enslaved and colonized us and invaded us. <coughs> so basically, this is a war between the, the white Arabs and the white Europeans, and it's none of our business as black people. I think that, in short, is my, my understanding of what the war, what the war, how the war does not concern us. I've, I've heard a lot of black people um, who feel that, you know, what's happening, the conflict in Libya right now, that this, you know, represents uh, concern for black people, you know, uh, that this is about uh, liberating black people uh, in the continent of Africa, and, and they see this related to their own problems with racism, white supremacy. How is it that so many uh, black people, why do you think so many black people think that, you know, what's happening uh, in Libya, that this is about some concern for black people? Well, I don't know. I think they're downright crazy or ignorant or both. For instance, uh, I saw an interview by Cynthia McKinney where she claimed that Libya is, Af is in Africa and that the Libyans are black. Now, she's got to be blind or crazy to maintain that Gaddafi is a black man and that all the, even the people in Benghazi are black people. People who have their eyes open and have no confusion in their heads when they watch these new television images will see for themselves that these are not black people, these are white people. So I don't know where they get, they get their confusion from, but I think they are the people that you should ask. Ask, call in Cynthia McKinnon and ask her when did Gaddafi become a black man? Does, doesn't she have glasses? Can't she see? So we have to start asking our people basic elementary questions. When, a man, when somebody gets up and says that a white man is a, is a black man, we, we, should, we, should, we, should, we should either dismiss him outright or put him on the spot. Let him explain how he turns black into white or white into black. So I think they're all crazy and confused. And I don't, I don't know their motives. People speculate as to their motives. But I can only offer one, one clue. For the last 50 years, people have been taught that all of Africa is one, that all the Arab peoples are one. And the greatest criminal in, in disseminating that idea was Kwame Nkrumah, which is continentalism. He went and married an Arab woman, and six months later called the Arabs a conference of African states and told them that they were now one people. Now, I don't, I don't understand the historical basis for that kind of claim. And he never bothered to explain. He just made it an assertion and didn't bother to give his reasons. And when a, a doctrine has been promoted for 50 years, you'll find a lot of people believing it, just as all kinds of crazy ideas have been propagated. This continentalist pan Africanism is one of our deadly ideas that have been internalized by a lot of people, and they can't get around to getting rid of it or to even questioning it. So when you tell us that all, all the white people settled in Africa are Africans with us, then you're, you're either in terms of history or deliberately for some motive of yours refusing to accept the facts of history. So I think part of the confusion is what's sold by Nkrumah with his continentalist Pan-Africanism, uh, Pan which, which gave rise to the OAU and from there to the AU, which the black states, the black countries, and the Arab, white Arab countries in Africa are locked together as if they are one people with one interest and one history and one culture and whatever. So people who have been brought up on that idea for 50 years we find it difficult to, to, face, to the reality, face up to the reality that we are not one people with the Arabs, even if they are settled in Africa. That a python has come into your compound and taken up position in part of it and it's raising its, uh, its uh, offspring there doesn't make him part of your family. The Arab invaders have taken over a, one third of our continent and have transferred a huge number almost two-thirds of their population to Africa. That doesn't make them Africans. Just as all the, all the blacks who have settled in Europe or uh, live in Europe are not Europeans. You may give, they may carry European passports, but when it comes to how people are treated, you will know the difference between the genuine Europeans, the whites, and the, and the immigrant blacks who, have, who are now living among them. 
so basically, I think part of the confusion has to be laid at the doors of Kwame Nkrumah for his continentalist doctrine of Pan-Africanism. But even more important is why haven't people for 50 years criticized and repudiated that doctrine? If something is obviously false, why do people cling to it for so long? Well, here we have to go into the uh, psychology of, of black people and their hunger to, to be white. We see, it, we see it every day. They, they bleach, they straighten their hair, they try to imitate white culture. They, as uh, Amos Wilson says, they have a white self ideal. In their heads, they want to be white people. They see themselves as white people. And if they can't be white people, they want to be near whites or be with them. So this integrationist mentality, I think it's, it has, has a part to play in all this confusion. Because they, they, they want to be, they don't want to be accused of being racist by of excluding, excluding the white, settl, white colonialists and settlers in Africa from anything they do in Africa. So they are eager to include any white person in their organizations and in their concept of who the African is. So they bring, if Gaddafi or if the Arabs, the white Arabs are available, even if they are not available, they try to drag them into our organizations and into our meetings and classify them as the same people as us. And when people do these integrationists, because that's what they basically are, the continentalists are basically integrationists. After 50 years, they, they believe their own propaganda and they, can, they begin to see the white, the white Arabs as black. And I think that is part of our problem. And of course, there are those who are who define Gaddafi and the Arabs as part of us because of their money. They throw their money around and they, they say, ah, they are trying to help us, so they must be part of us, they are one of us. So we've got all kinds of motives that prevent people from acknowledging the reality that their eyes can see. To tell me that Nkrumah's black face and um, Gaddafi's white face represent the same people, shows a, a, degree of, a high degree of self-confusion and self-delusion. So I think these psychological issues play a part in, have played a part in this, this uh, confusion that black people seem to have about, about the matter of Libya. Just, just for our listeners and myself, um, to your knowledge, has uh, Gaddafi ever referenced himself as being a black person? It doesn't matter what he says. Look at, open your eyes and see. I don't know that he has said any such thing. Okay. All I, all I, all I've heard of is that he he puts on African clothes and tries to claim that he's part of Africa. And he tries to organize what he calls the African kings and make himself the king of kings of Africa. He wears clothes that have uh, Af African designs on it. But anybody can do that. A Martian can do that. That doesn't make him an African. And even if he claims he says he's an African, open your, just, people should just open their eyes and see for themselves whether to believe him or not. Hmm. Context of white supremacy. Um, see, I, I definitely wanted to ask because I've, I've read this portion uh, from your book on the program before, uh, Decolonizing the African Mind. Uh, you discuss how white people uh, have used the Nobel Prize, particularly when they give it to a black person. Uh, they have used these folks to help continue uh, their domination over black and non-white people worldwide. Um, Correction, white Europeans, white people include the white Arabs, so if you just say white people, you are, you are confusing us. It's Europe that administers the Nobel Prize, the white Arabs don't administer it, so please specific. Oh, okay. No problem with that. Um, those specific white people uh, that give out this Nobel Prize, even though I think this benefits the entire white collective uh, when this prize goes out, uh, I think it does benefit the whole white team. Um, but you talked about specifically, uh, I think, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, 
Ralph Bunch, some of the other folks who've won this prize, uh, black people who've won this prize, and how this has just been used to refine white domination. Um, several other black people have won this prize since that time. Uh, do you see this trend continuing uh, when this prize goes out and it being used to uh, support white domination? Uh, first of all, I will refuse to answer that question because uh, it shouldn't be directing to me. I made that analysis 25 years ago. If you want to follow it up, you have how many scholars do you have teaching and lecturing in uh, schools and universities? You should ask them to follow up the work. I've uh, given an example of how that thing can be verified. What should be done is to ask them to go and do the job, assign it uh, to their students to do the research and come to their conclusions. And if they do so, you'll be sensitizing another generation to these issues. You can't come back to me 25 years later and ask me whether it has been continued. I've moved on to other issues. So I suggest you call, call some of those people onto your program and assign them to go and get their students to research the matter. That's how groups develop their knowledge and develop their researchers and thinkers. So don't go back to the same people all the time with the same old question that they've dealt with before. So that's my suggestion to you. I've not been following all the recipients. I don't, I, and it, it's no longer my interest. I'm not interested in that. There are other bigger issues in the world than the Nobel Prize. So please, if you think you want to find out whether they've continued, get, get some younger people to go and look into the matter and come, with, come up with their conclusions. Uh, help thereby to educate them. All right? Understood. Um... Let's see, I wanted to uh, check the seat. Justice, I believe she's on the line with us as well. Uh, did you have any other questions uh, that you would like to ask uh, Dr. Chin Weezo? If so, I believe your line is open. Uh, go right ahead. Oh, okay. I'm on the wrong line here. I will double check and make sure I have... Uh, have her correctly. Okay, I think I have your line. If you have some questions you would like to ask Dr. Chin Weezu, please go right ahead. Can I be heard now? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Okay. Okay, great. Um, greetings, Dr. Uh, Chin Weezu. Um, I have uh, some questions for you. Um, is there such a thing as a non-white uh, Arab? Uh, if so, can you name a few? Well, the... The, the classification of Arabs, when, once the Arabs came into Africa and into contact with black Africans, they've interbred with black Africans and produced what they recognize as black Arabs and treat as second class Arabs. People like the Arabs in uh, Sudan, people who call them, most of the people who call themselves Arabs in Sudan are, black, are mixed race um, people with Arab, part Arab and part black African. People like uh, the pre president of most of the people running Sudan today, uh, Omar Bashir, his predecessor, um, what's his name again? Anyway, most of the, the dominant group in, 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 in ruling Sudan are black, what the Arabs consider black Arabs and regard as inferior Arabs. So there are people who are black Arabs. They consider themselves Arab, they don't consider themselves African. And they're ready to do the, the dirty work of the white Arabs who are their masters. So there are such people who are black Arabs, and they are part of the confusion. They use them to create confusion among us. Because when you talk about Arab racism and enslavement and colonialism in Sudan, most people in the, in the American diaspora are confused because they'll see the images and they see these people they would consider black as, as, as being called Arabs. And... So they get confused. They say, how can these people be Arabs? They are black people from Africa. But they are not, they are black people and they are from Africa, but they are half caste Arabs. And they identify with the Arabs and are willing to do even more terrible things to fellow, uh, to other blacks, to other black Africans, so as to please their white Arab masters. Does that help you? Yes. Um, okay, what? good. What do what um what do most people in Libya look like? Most people in Libya have you been watching your television? You can answer that for yourself. If you can watch 
I think it's a question you can answer for yourself if you've been watching the news uh, all these months that these events have been happening. Most Libyans are white people. They are Arabs. They are white Arabs. Um, how there are some you... black Arabs among them. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I finished. What you say? Go on with your question. How do the black people in Libya function in relation to white people? Well, from what I got, um, they are second class citizens. Some people claim that um, there are a few high placed uh, blacks in the, in the Libyan government under Gaddafi. That may be true or not true, but like all the people in North Africa that they overran, the blacks among them identify themselves as Arabs, but they are not given equal rights. They are second class citizens. In fact, there was, back in the, 60, in the 1960s, there was a, or well, 70s, I forget now exactly, but it's in my book, The, the, the Decolonizing the African Mind. There was a Zimbabwe who, who traveled by road through North Africa. And, uh, and, and part of his encounter with the blacks there was that one of them, a school teacher, told him he was white. And he, had to, he laughed at the fellow and said, come on, how can you consider yourself white? Look at your skin color. And the man said, well, that's the way he was brought up. He was brought up to see himself as white. And um, so we have this deep confusion in the minds of the, of the black who are in Libya, the black Libyans. There are some, but they are not the dominant group in Libya. What suggestions can you offer to help eliminate racism, white supremacy? What suggestion for what? Um, the question was, what suggestions can you offer to help eliminate the system of racism, white supremacy? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a simple but serious question. Uh, project. Racism exists because of power. Power differential between whites and blacks. Racism was visited on the Chinese, if you know your history. The Chinese were treated like, just like black people were being treated. They used to have signs uh, saying, no, no Chinaman, they used to talk about somebody having a Chinaman's chance in life. Well, the Chinese were treated as under, an underclass as with the same racism that we were visited with until China got powerful. When the Chinese got their act together and liberated themselves from those who tried to conquer them and then built up their power, all that ended. We no longer hear them talking about having a Chinaman's chance. I think Malcolm X said something about that back in the 60s. But the trouble with us is that we've not bothered to focus on building our power. If you have a powerful country that's as powerful as Japan or, Ch or, Ch or China today, racism will disappear. So that is the root cure for racism. Shouting and protesting and all that is all well and good, but it's not going to change the damn thing as long as you remain weak and the, the, the whites remain powerful. If you want racism to, to disappear, Put all your energy and your thoughts into building up black power in the world. If you can create a black superpower somewhere in Africa that has economic clout, that has military clout, that can defend this territory, and that can prevent anybody from coming to Africa and doing whatever they like, then you get the respect you want. And then you'll find that nobody will treat you the way they treat you because of what of racism. So the bottom line is, Focus your energy not on all these distractions, but on how to build a black superpower in Africa. This was Gavi's recipe for solving our problem, and he gave this recipe 80 years ago in the 1920s. And our leaders have failed to, to believe it or to act on it, which is why we are where we, still where we are. So the younger people should set their minds and set their goals that the key project for them is to build up a black superpower in Africa. How they will do it, they, have to, they will have to work out 
in, in concrete details, but that is the only thing that will end racism in the world against black people. Is, is that clear? Yeah, uh, you, you uh, answer my question. Um, I know that racism, white supremacy, is a global system. I was just wondering how the system of racism, white supremacy, shows itself in your area of the world known as Nigeria. It shows itself um, in much the same way as it shows itself everywhere else. Your leaders, let's start with your leaders. They don't have confidence in themselves, so they go about inviting all these white advisors and experts to tell them things that they can do for them, they should be able to do for themselves. So your government policies are dictated by the IMF, the World Bank, all these development experts, white people who come to give them all this information and mislead them. So at the level of government, it manifests in the policies and the attitudes of our leadership political, military, or whatever, intellectual leaders, if you call in, if you, if you invite one of the white people to give a lecture, the place will be full. If you invite some black person who knows even more than that white chap, they will not take an interest. So we, we, we react in a, in a, in a way that, def, that, that defers to the whites. People still, and I'm sure that happens in the States, a lot of People go around bleaching them themselves, bleaching their skin, especially the women, wearing white people's wigs. They disdain African costume or, or African hairstyles. This is all part of manifestation of racism, and it is here too, as it is, I believe, in the United States and other parts of the world. The automatic, the white person gets automatic respect anywhere in Africa till tomorrow. The, the, the mere fact that they have white skin makes them special people. Even the police will defer to them and not treat them the way they would treat somebody with black skin. So it might it manifests in all the normal, in all the usual ways everywhere that racism exists. Blacks are seen as at the bottom, the least valuable. The, the police will be more brutal to the blacks than to the whites. And... Uh, they have all kinds of special advantages, special economic privileges. I don't know if that helps you get a picture of how it operates here in our own behavior. What what needs to be said or done to to decolonize a black person's mind? What needs to be done? to decolonize a black person's mind. Well, um, the, it, you've got to start, and what? Um, I'll uh, repeat the question. Um, what needs to okay. be said or done to decolonize a black person's mind? I'll uh, take, take it in two approaches. First, start with the children. If you train the children from the day they are born, to have respect for themselves, to be loyal to the black race, you have a, you have a better chance of them not becoming, having to decolonize their minds because you will Africanize their minds from day one. And that is easier than trying to decolonize the mind of somebody who is 25 or 30 or older. So looking towards the future, what we have to find out is what kinds of stories, what kinds of um, TV teams must we give to the babies right from the day they are born. Things like giving them white dolls, which was what Gavi was preaching against back in the 1920s. Showing, and all these images that glorify whites, whether they're on TV or in, or in songs or in plays or movies. If we, we have to insulate our children from these things because by the time they are three or four, they already see whites as special and privileged and to be obeyed or deferred to. So to prevent the colonization of the mind is a more serious task, and we have to start with the babies from the day they are born. For the older people, it's a, li it's a large propaganda campaign, an educational project, to get them to unlearn all the things they have learned in growing up. So you have to give them the right kinds of books, get them to read, 
case in, in Africa, it was a read from my own point, from the Afrocentric point of view, get to teach them things about the history of black people so that they don't go around with the notion that black people have never done anything significant in the world. Because that is part of the propaganda that makes people defer to whites. Teach them what black people have done down through history and why they have failed in the last 2,000 years. You have to also explain that to them. As to the reasons why they allow themselves to be defeated time and time again for the last 2,000 years. And one of the most important things you need to get to uh, get people to understand is that because there's this fallacious notion that blacks have never contributed anything to civilization. So you have to give them information as to what blacks have done or done through history from the time of ancient Egypt till today, particularly about black scientists and inventors. Because part of the mentality in, in uh, falsehood is that blacks have never invented anything have not contributed anything significant that anybody should respect. If you get around and show them what they did in ancient Egypt, how they found their civilization, how they created the sciences and taught them to the Greeks, and, they, and how they invented the, a religion that became the, the, the prototype for Christianity and Islam, and all the things that these religions took from Egyptian religion. The more people understand these things, these achievements of black societies, not just of black individuals, the more they'll have the self-confidence to resist claims that they're an inferior people. So I think that is what you have to do. Great educational task to decolonize the minds of um, adults and a, an even more important educational task to, to Africanize the minds of your babies and teach them loyalty to the black race. There's a lot that's going on around them that teaches them disloyalty to the black race. And you have to start very early to teach them that they need to be loyal to the black race. So I think those are the two major tasks for those who want a change in our own mentality. Um, thank you very much. Okay. okay you're most welcome. Um, yeah, thank you very much, and, uh, go, and, uh, back to you, Gus. Context of white supremacy. Um, when you, uh, opened the book to the West and the rest of us, um, you had what I thought, and I still think, incredibly profound passage on how, uh, white people treat their dogs, uh, better than they treat black people. Um, and you, in fact, mailed me uh, a photograph to kind of drive that, home, that point home uh, earlier today. Um, can, you, can you share some of that with our audience? Well, at the time I was writing the West and the Rest of Us in the early 70s, I was referring specifically to things like um, the restaurant they had in New York where the rich take their dogs, to, to dine on food that uh, most people can't afford in the world, and certainly most black people couldn't afford. Well, the picture I sent you is a picture from New Orleans during the Katrina, when they were evacuating people from New Orleans during when Katrina hit. And the picture has two components. One is an open truck in which they crowded all kinds of black people and trying to evacuate them. And the other one was a brand new Greyhound uh, bus with air conditioning, in which they passed dogs, stray dogs from an animal hospital to evacuate them. So you can see how, how the black victims of Katrina were being evacuated and how the dogs were being evacuated. And that can tell you the difference between the way they treat their dogs and, and the way they treat black people. People who, who used to take their animals to the restaurants were doing so in an individual capacity. The picture I sent to you is a matter of, of state officials carrying out evacuation procedures and, and carrying out the same mentality and using the same mentality of well, first class treatment for the dogs and third class treatment for blacks. So it, the, 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 the statement is still true in this century. It was true in the 1970s 
when I read the West and the rest of us, and it's still true in the 20th and 21st century, as illustrated by Katrina evacuation pictures. Mm. Uh, I unfortunately agree. Um, White Dog, I'm thinking of White Dog. You folks should check that film out and or read the book. Um, I'm not hearing you. Oh, uh, can you hear me, sir? For a while there, I didn't hear you. You were saying, unfortunately, something, and I didn't hear what you said. Oh, okay. I said, unfortunately, I agree with you, sir, and uh, that it reminded me of a book and a film uh, titled White Dog that is, it, it illustrates exactly what you're saying, um, unfortunately. Um, I read uh, one of your essays, uh, and I thought this was really important. I was, was hoping you could elaborate on this statement. Uh, you wrote, war is a deadly serious business, not an affair for visionaries. What we, the black race, sorely need and have long lacked are practical, down-to-earth, realistic, and sober generals and leaders. And we are at war. Economic, military, political, ideological, cultural, intellectual, etc. And have been for two or more millennia. And have been losing non-stop all that time is this an uh and i was just i was hoping you could elaborate on that and uh yeah if you think that's an accurate assessment it's not an accurate assessment but there are so many things in that passage you are quoting uh i guess particularly the last sentence um that we've been losing non-stop black people specifically we've been losing non-stop in this war with uh with white people well, I think, it, I think it's an accurate assess, assessment down to tomorrow. If you read Chancellor Williams' um, a book on the destruction of black civilization, it becomes clear that we've been losing this war for 6,000 years. And it hasn't, we haven't stopped losing. Even some, some of our so-called victories turn out to be defeats. And I'll give you an, uh, an example. Our so-called independence movement did not achieve what they set out to achieve or what they now claim they achieved. They never achieved independence. So we, 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 we claim we were victorious, but in actual fact, we were not. By the time the white boys gave you your so-called independence, they had changed the game. And you ended up being not independent, but being self-governing in your prison, prison cells. It was as if um, we wanted to make a jailbreak and dug a tunnel and started going out. But in the meantime, the jailer had built a new perimeter wall so that when we came up, we were still within the confines of the new prison. So that's what happened with our independence movement. And even though we think we succeeded, we, we failed. We lost that battle. And the most poignant example of that is the case of South Africa under Mandela. Everybody celebrates Mandela as being victorious in overthrowing apartheid, but in reality he didn't. What he did was substitute black managers of the apartheid state for the white managers. And part of the reason why that is, why, one way to understand that is that all the economic uh, Objectives of the anti-apartheid movement have not have not been fulfilled. None of them has been fulfilled. The land is still with the whites. The economy is still with the whites. The standard of living of the blacks has not improved. A few blacks have gotten money and position, but most blacks have not. People who who did, they, at the initial flurry after 1994, they built home houses for people for, for for people and connected with electricity and telephone lines, but a few months later, they disconnected them. So even though we celebrated their, vict their so-called victory, it turned out to have been a, an empty victory. They didn't win. They won office, but they didn't win power. By the time the white boy handed the, uh, the offices of state to them, the parliament and the state house and all that, they had put, up a, they put in a new arrangement whereby they couldn't uh, do what they set out, what they 
promised the electorate when they were mm-hmm. doing the elections in 1994. And there's a very good book, a book which contains a very good description of what happened, how they lost the, the anti-apartheid war, even though they, they appear to have been victorious. Uh, it's a book by Naomi Klein called The Shock Doctrine, and it has, it's chapter 10 is devoted to South Africa and what happened to the so-called liberation movement and why it, it was a failure, masquerading as a victory. And anyway, even without those details, we should get suspicious. If, when, if your general says he has defeated the enemy and the enemy are celebrating him and making him a hero and a saint, it should force you to ask, did he really defeat them? Why would they be celebrating their defeat and, and calling him a hero and giving him all kinds of accolades? That's not how, how defeated people behave towards their, those who defeated them. So that should have gotten us suspicious right from the start. But luckily for us, people have investigated the actual victory and the evidence is quite clear as to how and why they lost. And why they refused to acknowledge that they lost the, 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 the game. So basically, we are still the people who have been losing for 6,000 years. And even our latest triumph was, a, was not a victory. So I think on that basis, we can say that it's still an accurate assessment of the situation today that um, we've been losing this war nonstop for thousands of years. And even our so supposed victories are not, have not been actual victories. At least they've not been as victorious as they claim to be. Is there any other thing you want me to comment on on that passage you you, you quoted? Um, let's see. I guess specifically because this this rings a bell with me in terms of needing uh, practical, down to earth, realistic, and sober generals and leaders. Um, I, I I feel that is incredibly important and I guess if you could comment on why we had that seems so basic uh, why do you think we have lacked these kind of obvious fundamentals uh, in terms of building building a structure to combat uh, the system of white supremacy okay I'll give, it, give that a go well first of all we would like to talk about visions and visionaries now, me, I don't trust visions and visionaries. You don't know where they get their visions from. From get it, if you want visions, from the easiest way is to go and smoke pot or LSD or mescaline, and you get visions, of, uh, plenty of visions. From get their visions from hunger, from get their visions from God, or claim to get it from God. But me, uh, I like to point out the, the, the anecdote about two members, two, two inmates of an insane asylum. One had his vision and, and, and declared that God told him he was Napoleon. And the guy in the next bunk said, but I did not. So they got their visions from God knows where and claimed that God told them. So when we have these leaders that are tied with visions or with Nkrumah's vision of the continentalist and African movement, union government, you wonder where he got his vision from because that vision is not helping us. So what we need are not visionaries, though we keep clamoring for visionaries. We want to be as sensible and down to earth and face up to the fact that war is, war is a continuation of politics. <laughs> While the Chinese say <coughs> war is politics with, with, blood, with bleeding. Politics is war without bleeding. And in war, you have to be very sober and realistic about your strength, the strength of your enemy, the position of the terrain, and all the factors that come into play in the war. You can't, you can't tolerate wishful thinking. And we, with our visionaries, we have a lot of wishful thinking. And so we have to avoid that kind of leadership and population. We have to start creating in our population a distaste for those, all these visionaries who go around screaming that, uh, that they've seen some vision. All these institutions on going to diviners. So many of our leaders go to diviners to find out what, what to do. And diviners have no special insight in the reality. If you want to look at what's happening, you have to look at the fa- all the factors, concrete factors in the real life. And then do your serious thinking and analysis. A diviner is just a con man of some kind. 
And these are the type of people that our leaders go to and come up with all kinds of funny ideas and then try to impose them on us. So what I mean by all that is that we have to change our attitudes to the world, take a more scientific approach to things, and make sure our leaders do the same. So they don't wake up from, 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 a, from a, a confused dream and try to implement policy based on what they saw in the dream. And we have to hold them accountable. And whatever they do, we must criticize them and evaluate them realistically. So that's the only way we can begin to handle our, rea our situation seriously. So that's, that's the only elaboration I think I can offer at this point. Um, we have, uh, I think, five minutes left uh, in the hour. Um, I was hoping I could check the phone lines to see if uh, anyone listening, if they had a quick question for you, if that's uh, acceptable, Dr. Chinwizu. I didn't hear you. What did you say? Uh, uh, can you hear me now, sir? I can hear you now, yeah. Okay. Uh, I said uh, we have a few minutes left uh, in the hour, and I wanted to check... Mm -hmm the phone lines to see if anyone had a question for you uh, before uh, you exit. Okay, fine. Do that. Okay. Uh, let's see. A uh, person that called in from California and person that called in from D.C., did either of you two have a question? This is D.C. I have a question. In terms of the nation um, called Ethiopia, um, and uh, your career broke off from Ethiopia to civil war, um, in terms of how they dealt with colonization and white supremacy racism, many of the Ethiopians that I've met or encountered, they will say, well, they defeated being colonized. So... What do you know about how they went about doing that in general, how they managed to defeat the British in terms of colonization? Thank you. How they managed to defeat what? Colonization. Well, that was back in the 19th um, century, if I remember correctly. When the Europeans were doing what they invading Africa and conquering bits and pieces, the Italians tried to conquer Ethiopia, but the king of Ethiopia at the time, Menelik, did what he had to do. He reorganized his army, reorganized his society, imported the right kind of weaponry, and used that to defeat the Italian army. Most of our other leaders did not do it that way, and so they lost and got conquered and colonized. So basically, they had a leadership that knew that it, that it had to fight a war and win. And whatever it had to do to, to, to win, it did it. So whatever weapon it had to find, it went and found it. Whatever, however it had to reorganize its armed forces, it did so. And that was why it was able to defeat the, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in the late 19th century. That is the standard recipe. Whenever you have an invader... You have to make up your mind, do you want victory or you want defeat? And then you, you plan accordingly and organize yourself accordingly to mm -hmm. defeat the enemy. And there's no two ways about it. You, you can't do it by, by, by going to pray to God. That, that doesn't help you. God will not come down to fight on your side if you, have, if you are weak. God always manages to be on the side of the, of the stronger group, the stronger army. So if you want God to be on your side, do your own share of the work. Get sensible leaders who will organize the, the people and their armies in such a way and, and command the armies in a way that will bring victory. Then God will be on your side. So basically, the Ethiopians were able to do it because they had a good leadership that was nationalistic and knew that it had to win that war and did everything necessary to win the war, including making sure it had the right quantity and caliber of arms. So that's all I know about how the Ethiopians wanted to escape being colonized. But that was escaping colonization of one kind. Because they remained economically weak, they became a new colony to, to other groups like the British. They defeated the Italians militarily, but they didn't defeat the British economically. So it, Ethiopia 
has been a, a new colony of either the British or later in the 20th century of the Americans, just like everybody else in Black Africa. So yes, they won one war against the colonizers, but the, the military war, but they did not win the economic war. So that's my comment on Ethiopians and their history of anti-colonialism. Does that help you? Call her in. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Um, wow. That. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, some of your time with us. I know you said you were having a, had a little bit of a headache today. Um, I guess I just before we go, I was just curious if you could give us. Do most of the of the black people uh, that you are around do they understand that black people are at war with white people? Do they understand that? No, most people don't understand that. Hmm. In fact, if you tell them that they have enemies in the world, they look at you with with surprise. They don't because nobody has taught them their colonial history. Nobody has taught them the way the world is structured and the way it operates. All they get is Western propaganda, white people's propaganda about how they are our development partners. People who used to who used to call imperialists and colonialists are now called. They repackage themselves and call themselves development partners. And what do you have to do? Become development partners. They come to run the economy, have their representatives in your ministries and your schools, and make sure that your country's budget serves their interests rather than that of your people. So there's a lot of ignorance about the fact that we are at war and have been at war for a long time with the white peoples of the world. And that is the fault of our education system, 50 years after independence. The education system does not teach them about colonialism and its effects and how it's operated and who the white people are and how they behave and have behaved all over the world. So this ignorance is the fault of our leaders who have made sure, made sure that they continue with colonialist education that glorifies white people. Uh, continue with Christianity that glorifies a white Christ. So people, the image of white people is based on wanting to be saved by some white fellow. Who they, who they are taught is, uh, is Jesus Christ their Savior. So there's a lot of this ignorance and confusion about our place in the world and what we need to do about it. That's very unfortunate, but we know the cause of it. It's a, a, a compromised black colonial leadership, the compradors who are running our countries in the interest of the, of the, of the white powers. Wow. Uh, I just, again, want to uh, thank you for sharing some of your uh, Saturday evening with us. Um, your your books helped a lot. I was one of those confused folks, and your books helped uh, correct a lot of my confusion. And uh, having you on the program, like I said, we're just super appreciative. And uh, thank you so much for sharing some of your time with us, sir. You're most welcome. Thank you. Yes, sir. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. Context of white supremacy. Um, wow, real pleasure to have him uh, on the program with us, Dr. Chin Wizu. I, I, I read uh, <laughs> read Decolonizing the African Mind some years ago, before the context of white supremacy even began. Um, I think I read it about a year before we uh, began the program in 2007, and uh, <laughs> yeah, helped clear up a lot of confusion. Uh, we'll take a uh, quick break, and then we'll come back with uh, a news. Uh, Justice, do you have a news report for us? Yes. Grooving. We will take uh, a quick break, and then uh, we'll come back. We'll get a news report from uh, Justice, and I'll check with the uh, folks that are on the line if they have <clears throat> thoughts about uh, Dr. Chen Weezu. I'd be curious if folks had heard of him before. I, I suspect that most people probably, unless you listen to this program maybe and heard me reference him, I suspect a lot of people are not familiar with him. Um, hopefully that will change. You'll, you'll investigate some of his books. and uh, Yeah, but we'll be right back. Context of White Supremacy. I was in the land of
you all got uh, constructive information uh, from the program. Um, hopefully people, as I said, I hope, you know, folks will check out um, some of Dr. Chen Wiesu's, check out some of his work. Um, I think he has uh, just outstanding books on racism, white supremacy. They will really help you clear up that confusion around the fact that, hey, we are at war with these white people worldwide. Um, the West and the, uh, the West and the rest of us uh, and decolonizing the African mind. Both of those outstanding reads um, full of constructive information. Um, I, uh, before I hit justice for the news report, uh, I think we will attempt to broadcast uh, every day for January. Uh, and the reason, hopefully this will run into the website for the cows being completed. So, uh, Hopefully, it'll run into having the web page up and running and uh, broadcasting. Uh, my, my, I have many reasons for doing this. Um, one of the other reasons is because uh, when we did this back in January, um, it did a lot in terms of growing the program, picking up more listeners. I mean, it just it generates a lot more content. Um, and uh, it gave people an opportunity to make suggestions for guests because we had space for a lot more programs um so yeah if you have suggestions for programs guests um and it, you know pretty much anyone on the planet is game at this point because it's not very difficult um if they got a phone you know we should be able to uh to make it happen so you know if you see someone talking about racism white supremacy or something that you think would be constructive uh for us to hear about anywhere on the planet you know now would be the time to suggest um because we want to try and broadcast uh daily uh for june and as i said hopefully that will run into the website being up hopefully um and we will try to fundraise for june um, that way we can hopefully knock out the website. Uh, hopefully I can have a mixer that would pretty much solve the problem of having the cowbell and having all of the uh, sound playing uh, simultaneously so the cowbell could be ringing uh, while I'm speaking and all that good stuff. So there's some things I'm going to try and, and see what would be good to uh, further grow the program but uh, hopefully we'll be very active for june and it will run into the website uh, actually being constructed uh, i actually saw some of the uh i guess when i don't i'm very ignorant about the website, that's why i can't really say a whole lot about it because i'm very ignorant about all this um but they they just sent me like uh, i guess when they when people construct a website you just kind of make um just kind of a sloppy design copy just to kind of give you a rough idea of what it could look like just so you can say okay well I like this don't that sort of thing and I saw that for the cows man it was uh <laughs> I almost looked at it like I have no idea who that is supposed to be for um it was it was incredible it was incredible um I, yeah I was I still am kind of uh speechless about it it was uh yeah, it was it was stunning. It was it was it was so impressive that I almost felt like I had to uh I almost felt like I should write the trifling white people at Blog Talk and thank them. Uh which many folks said, you know, they thought was going to be the case. Uh, particularly if the cows got their own website, they thought that would be way way better than being on Blog Talk. And I saw just from the rough sketches of what I saw Man, the trifling white people at Blog Talk, they might be the best contributors to the cows thus far, hands down. Like, uh, man, it was incredible if it uh, gets together. Man. Uh, at any rate, so yeah, that's for June. So if you have ideas for guests 
or topics for children's program, anything, you know, now would be the time to toss those out um, because we should be very active uh, for June and hopefully, you know, and if it doesn't happen, then, you know, no worries. It'll hopefully it'll come uh, sooner, sooner or later. Um, Let's see. Um, To Justice's question, she uh, sent me a message. I was not able to get authorization from Mr. Nero. um, So... I don't know. Um, yeah, I, 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 didn't, I didn't get authorization, so yeah, I don't have permission <laughs> to share, but hopefully I will. Um, hopefully I will. Mr. Nero, longtime listener and investor. I know a lot of folks always enjoy uh, hearing his commentary. Um, he, too, is on the plantation and dealing with racism, white supremacy, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can get permission to uh, give an update on what he's been doing. He's still listening to the program in, in the archives and uh, definitely recognize uh, Mr. Nero and his uh, consistent support of the program. Uh, Justice, if you uh, want to get to the news, that would be great. Um, uh, um, uh, let's see. This report uh, is from uh, RacismDaily.com. It was posted on May 27th of this year. Um, The title is Pennsylvania Man Gets Prison Term for Crossburning. A Pennsylvania man was sentenced to one year in prison on Thursday for his role in the burning of a cross outside the house of an African-American foster child. Uh, um, Authorized said... Michael B. Lonis, uh, 19, uh, pleaded guilty earlier this year to to charges related to the November 2009 incident in West Wheatfield, about 50 miles east of Pittsburgh. Two other men, Michael Bracken, 23, and Kenneth Stiffy, uh, 21, also pleaded guilty and are scheduled to be sentenced later this year. B. Lonis was sentenced in federal court to one year in prison, followed by three years of supervised release, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office. According to local media reports, the target of the cross burning was a 16-year-old high school football player who had lived for a several years for several years with a foster family in West Wheatfield, a, a predominantly white r- r- rural community. Cross burning was a tactic of intimidation used by the Ku Klux Klan for decades in, in the United States. B. Lonis ple- pleaded guilty to one charge of con- of conspiracy to interfere with the housing rights of another, which carries a maximum of 10 years in prison. Um, this uh, news report was from Racism Daily.com, and my thoughts are, uh, uh, I hope uh, the white person gets uh, at least his whole life in prison. Uh, he's a white person. Uh, I, um, yeah, I hope uh, his whole life uh, will be in prison. Not even 10 years or a year, just his whole life. That's embarrassing. That's really all I have to say. That is, I mean, that's just a total uh, disgrace. Um, It's a total disgrace. To even have to comment on that is a disgrace. Uh, The one thing I will say, the strongest religion on the planet is the religion of white supremacy. Those crosses and all that... They, you might think those are the accoutrements of Christianity. Do not be fooled. That is the religion of white supremacy. That's my kind. And that's a total disgrace. I mean, total disgrace. Total disgrace. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I mean, like, what's so constructive about burning crosses uh, in people's faces, you know? Mm-hmm. 
any uh, any other thoughts on uh, on that report or uh, or anything else? Um, uh, nope, nope, mm -mm. Grooving, grooving. Uh, before, uh, before I hit the phone lines, I, I will say, I think from, from this point forward, at least on this program, uh, anytime I hear IMF, that will be a cowbell ring. Uh, from now on, uh, that will be a cowbell ring. So that'll just be instituted once uh, I get that mixer. I think that will clear up the audio. So we'll be back to having the sound effects, you know, live time, and we can do it, you know, as people are are speaking on the phone. Uh, but yeah, from this this moment forward, and I'm I'm probably a few days late on that. I'm I'm about a I'm, maybe it should have been that way from the very beginning. But uh, at least since uh, you know Dominic Strauss Kahn. Uh, from this point forward, IMF will be a cowbell on this program. Um, What's uh, we'll IMF? Uh, International Monetary Fund. I think I got that correctly. I'll double double check to make sure I got my uh, acronyms correct. <laughs> um, Those are important. Using <laughs> <laughs> um, code. Using code. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Uh, yes, International Monetary Fund. International Monetary Fund. Um, yeah, that's that would be you know interesting study in white supremacy. Um, I suspect if you ever see a photograph of the people uh, who are in charge of the International Monetary Fund, I suspect it would be all white folks. Um, one of them used to be Dominic Strauss Kahn, cowbell ring um <laughs> maybe we should do a program about them at some point that would probably be very constructive um yeah we'll file that away maybe we can do that for june international monetary fund i'm sure that would yield a lot of i think uh there's a lot of confusion about you know these types of organizations uh the imf homeland security might be good to do some programs on that within the the context the understanding of white supremacy um let's see imf okay so i got that um, I will say, and I think this is important, this, this program, it reminded me of when uh, Dr. Layla Africa was on the program uh, back uh, February of 2011 this year. Um, it reminded me because I remember, I remember Justice said that, uh, I don't know, she felt like he wasn't uh, interested in, in chatting um, something in the ball. Do you, do you recall this, Justice? Um, recall from whom? Uh, Dr. Africa. He was on the program, Black Male. Uh, he was on the program oh. in February. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you, I know it's been a while. I mean, it's been a lot of programs since then. But um, I, I remember <laughs> that program. Um, you and some other people thought, you know, he he sounded as though he wasn't as interested or what have you, um, which may have been the case. But I thought he just had a lot of constructive information, and uh, I have a lot of you know regard for his work. I think it has helped a lot of people become less confused about racism, white supremacy, and I felt like that on the program today uh, a little bit, but he did, he did say from the very beginning that he had a mild headache, so I definitely think that that should be, uh, that's important. He, I mean, he was going to be on for the full two hours and said he would prefer to just do uh, an hour uh, at the most because he had, uh, he had a pretty bad headache, so um, he was, he was a soldier <laughs> today because, man, I, uh, I have had headaches and I cannot imagine being asked questions uh, by other confused victims while I have a headache. Um, yeah, so for sure, Dr. Chen Weizhou, fantastic, and definitely his books, I think, uh, will help you become less confused. But I will say, I think as a, as a victim, um, I could imagine, like me, when I was less confused, responding, um, responding in a manner and getting upset. Um, there where it could have been less constructive and I just I think as a victim um, if you can be uh, just kind of more business like about things where you know even if someone says something and, and you don't think it's as courteous as it could be or or you think uh, wow this this could be a little rude um, you know if you can just try to stay business like I think that can 
that can be very helpful uh, in making sure that th uh, things remain constructive, um, as constructive as possible. Uh, just try to keep it business. <laughs> you might have to, uh, you know, take, uh, you might have to endure um, something that you view as, a, as a, a slight or somebody saying something that you don't think is as courteous as it could be. But, you know, as long as things are constructive and it's not out of hand, you know, try not to worry about that too much, uh, if you can. Uh, that said, uh, I will check the uh, check the line, see if folks uh, have any comments uh, on today's broadcast. Uh, I'm particularly interested about... Uh, his thoughts on uh, Libya and Gaddafi not being a black person. Uh, I've heard a lot of people who seem to think, you know, that this conflict um, is related to, you know, black people. This has something to do with black people. This is black people um, trying to get things together and being less confused. Um, I was, I, I mean, I, I knew he was going to say that, but I was kind of surprised when I read that because I don't really hear people saying that, or I hadn't heard anyone else saying, you know, Gaddafi is not a black person. These are not black people. This has, you know, this is in no way at all concerned with liberation of black people. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear around that issue specifically. Um, I'll go, uh, folks, I haven't got to yet. Rise, hey, Rue, and uh, just non-mighty wick. Um, your lines are open. Uh, que I'll just open all. I don't feel like <laughs> if you called in, your line is open. You can, uh, let me know if you are not interested in talking. I can mute your line. So if you called in, your line is open. If you are not interested in talking, please let me know and I will mute your line. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, this is uh, Cleveland. I was one. Um, I do have something to share, but it's not on top of the program, so I'll just let it roll a little longer. But uh, oh. I just, uh, I'll just wait. Okay, I will. I will make sure that I save time for you to get your your comment in. Um, yeah, yeah, this this is not going to take up the whole you know time on the program. So yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Y yes, sir. I like that. I just want to say that is great code. I like that. I, I was gonna. I had been meaning to say that. Uh, I I think. Um, just in terms of codifying language and communication, staying on topic is very important. In fact, Mr. Fuller told me that is one of the key things when he goes back to listen to programs. He tries to make sure that he stayed on topic. Uh, I think that is very important. Um, if someone has thrown out a particular question or format, very important to stay on topic and not deviate from that. So I just wanted to throw that that is very important, staying on topic. Not that I always do that, not that it always happens here, but it, we should try to stay on topic. Thank you. Uh, so did folks have uh, thoughts, the other people that are on the line, thoughts or questions around uh, Lib uh, what uh, Dr. Chin Weezu shared around Libya? Gaddafi, he's not a black person. I'm sorry, I'm on the line, but I don't have any comment. Uh, but my phone was on mute because I was making noise, so I'll put it back on mute. No worries. I thought it was interesting that, um, it's not, you know, I, you might have misheard, but it sounded like you were saying that, um, you know, that conflict in Libya is between white people and that uh, black people, uh, we said the correct thing to be to leave it alone or not do anything with it or whatnot. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that will how that will play out. I guess I'm curious about the number of black people there who are just supposed to, I guess, uh, not you know, not pay attention to it. Um, but I don't know if anybody knows any more about that. I mean, if anyone else has heard that idea of Gaddafi uh, being, I guess, white and then. Um, you know, from that perspective, I'd be interested in hearing more about that. Wow. Had anybody heard that perspective before? <laughs> Yeah, I've heard uh, a lot of uh, inquisition into what 
Gaddafi's uh, classification is, uh, and uh, with with actually he's doing two or four African people. I've always uh, speculated on that myself. Uh, never really, never really got a lot of clarity. Uh, <clears throat> I don't try to, you know, uh, keep up with with that type of news. But uh, but um, yeah, I always want to exempt myself uh, what his intentions are. With because I think it's just you know codification to question whatever uh, information they're giving you on on these news sources. Uh, so anything they they're giving me. I'm um, questioning, you know, what, what's the purpose, or uh, what, how does this serve uh, white supremacy, and what way could this serve white supremacy, uh, them letting us be informed about what's going on in this part of the world, uh, this person called Gaddafi, and, you know, who he is, because, uh, you know, I think, I think the media does a pretty good job of, uh, uh, dictating uh, what we think and <clears throat> how we think about uh, you know things and uh, non-white people. So. Hmm. Just I don't know. I, w- I wanted to throw this out there, um, and I open up line sixty-eight. Uh, would it be more accurate to say that, as opposed to the media, that white people do a pretty good job of controlling how we think about things? I did say I was going to, uh, DC and, uh, the car 68 and, uh, Khalil Khan, uh, your, all three of your lines are open. Um, <laughs> I'll say something else. Oh, uh, DC, uh, DC, your line is open. I got that. Oh, I'm picking up background noise now. Okay, we're good. Uh, DC, were you saying something? Um, I'm not in a good place to talk right now, but um, I would like to keep my my phone on mute until I'm ready to speak. Oh, that's fine. Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm here I go. Okay. Um, at any rate, I was uh, I was also going to say um, I think one of the big reasons that I don't have the chat room is not open right now. Um, I think a big part of codification is also, like I said, developing better listening skills. Um, One thing I do think would be helpful for people who, if you haven't read Mr. Fuller's book, if you um, really are not, you know, saying, yes, I have I have made some progress. I'm still learning. I'm still confused and I'm definitely not perfected, but, you know, I have at least made some progress. I have been studying, being more codified with the way that I use words, uh, the way that I discuss uh, and express my views on racism, white supremacy. If you haven't really done some time doing that, I think it would be better to uh, do more listening and asking questions because um, I think a big part of the problem, non-white people, we're not codified, we're not precise with the way that we discuss racism, white supremacy, and we end up uh, being very inefficient, using a lot of words and not using the most accurate words to discuss the problem of racism, white supremacy. So I just wanted to get that out, and I'll I'll make a reminder uh, if I feel you know it's warranted from time to time. Um, did anybody else have thoughts on the the question on the table around uh, what's going on in Libya? If Gaddafi, if this is you know, is he a black person? Um, non-black person is he a white person um yeah anybody have any other thoughts on on that uh yes good afternoon yes can i be heard yes sir uh yes this is uh khalil again uh greetings everyone um yeah i had a question uh as far as um uh, the uh, Qaddafi situation um i haven't been reading a great deal on it um i, I would have loved to have to have asked Dr. Uh, Chin Wiesu, uh, hopefully I'm uh, pronouncing his name correctly. Um, he did point out that uh, he's not uh, black, uh, so he shouldn't be uh, uh, identified with our cause. But my question would have been, um, it appears that Minister Farrakhan has really been uh, going to bat uh, for uh, 
Mr. Gaddafi. Now, I understand that, you know, Gaddafi, over the course of the past 15, 20 years, he's had uh, ties to uh, uh, the Nation of Islam here in America, but I'm curious to know uh, you any uh, uh, other caller's thoughts on um, uh, Mr. Farrakhan, Minister Farrakhan's uh, 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 alliance, if you will, with uh, Mr. Gaddafi. I don't. I don't really know enough about it to uh, to comment on it sufficiently. Okay. Um, anyone else? Um, somewhat familiar with that? Hi. I'm not. Uh, well, I'm a little. I'm more familiar with Sarah Khan versus uh, Sarah Khan and Lydia, but he does speak on. Um, he does speak on Libya and uniting. I think, I personally think he's just trying to connect dots to where maybe the nation of Islam or black people will have somewhere to go, someone to have a basic uh, support for us, some kind of someone that will have a voice for, well, maybe the nation of Islam or just blacks in general versus what we don't have now because Farrakhan's the only one as far as the leaders uh or the so-called leaders for us, that um, can slip and spy over the place and um, connect with different people so when we're outsourced, maybe just the same way it was Cuba, when he did that kind of stuff, and Cuba was kind of giving out scholarships to the blacks that they wanted to go take, uh, you know, classes or go to college in Cuba, that kind of thing. So I just think he's trying to make connections to where when we're outsourced or, you know, they're tired of us, we have somewhere to go. That's just my personal thinking, just knowing uh, about the nation, because my mom was a Muslim, so it was, I've been kind of following that kind of thing in the 70s, so just that's just uh, my take, since no one else said anything. Okay, I'll push you. <laughs> um, and, and, and that makes sense. Um, this oh. is my understanding. Hang, hang on one second. I'm sorry. This is real important. Sure, sure. I, I was thinking this while that question was registering. The more I thought about it, I said, uh, Minister Farrakhan is not white. I don't have much confusion about that. Um, unless, you know, somebody has some, you know, new information for me. Uh, as he is not white, the problem is white people. And I could see how, I could see how this could go bad. Like, I could see how this could end up being very non-constructive uh, and being about, you know, is Farrakhan doing the right thing or da da da, da And, like, I, I'm not even informed enough about it to have, you know, intelligent conversation on it. But I do know he's not white. Uh, the problem is not what he's doing or not doing or what he thinks about Libya or even why he's doing that. The problem is white people. Very important, I think. Has anybody heard... Uh, has anybody seen or heard white people, I mean, anywhere in the world, uh, referring to Gaddafi as a white person? Uh, no, I've never heard uh, Gaddafi uh, being referred to as a white person. As a matter of fact, as far as my knowledge, uh, that particular uh, country, uh, that region of the world, uh, Libyans are pretty much considered Arabs. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that could be incorrect. So I've always identified Mr. Gaddafi as being an Arab. And uh, back to your point, Gus, you're, you're correct, of course. Minister Farrakhan is, is a black male. He's not white. Uh, my understanding is, is that, I don't know if you can remember, a couple of years back, uh, Mr. Gaddafi was going to offer uh, Minister Farrakhan in a nation of Islam, I think it was going to be a billion dollars uh, for the uh, nation's cause and trying to eradicate the system of uh, racism, white supremacy here in the uh, United States. And, of course, the United States government kind of denied... Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. hang on, hang on, hang on. Sure. This is what I mean about codification. Um, the most important thing that I remember about that story is what you just said. Uh, someone... I don't know if uh, Mr. Gaddafi, I don't know if he's a white person, non-white person. I haven't heard any white people reference him as a white person, but I haven't asked. Um, 
I don't know, but I know some Mr. Gaddafi is reported to have attempted to offer to give, you know, Mr. Farrakhan so much money. Not the United States government. Specifically, I'm sure it was some white people who said, no, he can't have it. That's the most important thing that I remember about that. Not whether he's white or not white, but that white people intervened and said no. And I would use that as a great illustration as long as white supremacy. That, I mean, that is a fabulous illustration of so much, no matter how much money it is. Even if it's a billion dollars, white people could just come and say, no, you can't have it. Sorry. <laughs> and that's that. That will be the end of the discussion. That is huge for anyone who thinks money that's what it's about. All the folks who have said it's just about money. Beautiful illustration and words. It's not the United States government. It's white people. I'm sure it was some white people who represent, in quotes, the so-called United States government who made that decision, who told him or wrote a letter, used words to let folks know it wasn't going to go down. Very important. Yeah, I and well, I and hang, hang on one second. Hang on, one second. Hang on one second. Hang on one second. This is what I mean about, you know, if you have not used, I believe you called in yesterday. You said you had not read Mr. Fuller's work. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Uh, I would like to request if you could listen a little bit more. And that's something I think I said repeatedly. That's why I don't have a chat room. I really think it's important to do. That's what I did. When I learned codification, I listened. I wasn't in a format where I could do a lot of talking i don't mind asking questions and such but uh i would like to make that request if you could listen a little bit and then i i'm leaving your mic open so you'll be able to come back in just listen a little bit for a while okay, okay. i appreciate it thank you sir um see did the uh, other folks if you all if you all don't have anything else on the libya thing that's fine i was just curious because i know that has been talked about a lot uh, seems like there's a lot of confusion around it. Um, did anybody else have thoughts around that? It was good that you let us know or you kind of um, clarified how white people, they call the final shot. It's like whatever we think we, we're going to get, they have to say so over whatever. No. No, no. So that that was pretty good because regardless of whatever, if they say no, and since we don't own anything or have anything, then it's no. So I thought that was that was clever that you uh, kind of elaborated on on that. Yeah. And if the details of that story, you know, I guess the part about white people telling Gaddafi no or stopping that transaction, and at least that will be some evidence to suggest that, uh, you know, if, if he is, or if not, he has a white person, or white Arab, or whatever, uh, it sounds like there's some people more powerful than him uh, to stop uh, stop him from doing what he, you know, what, what seems like he was wanting to do. Like I said, if, that, if, if all that's accurate. And that doesn't even mean that he's not a white person. He could be white, and just that there are more powerful white people. I see that every day, that, you know, this person is white, but there are some white people that are more powerful. So that could be true, or it could mean, you know, he's not on the on the white team. Yep. Well, if it's okay, Gus, can I uh, ask this question and uh, make this point? Well, let me ask this question first. Is that okay with you? Yes. Oh, uh, well... Just recently, uh, Minister Farrakhan issued a warning to uh, President Obama. I believe this was when uh, the United States was uh, in the process. Again, I, I could be incorrect, and, and, and trying to stay uh, uh, on par with Cole, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, when the United States, it looked like there was going to be this rift between the United States and Libya. Minister Farrakhan issued this warning to President Obama. Uh, uh, what the potential ramifications could be uh, in attacking Libya. Uh, so, again, I mean, whether we classify uh, Qaddafi as, I, again, I've never heard of him being classified as white. I've always identified him with being an Arab. Uh, but, again, it, it, it appears that uh, Minister Farrakhan is perceiving that uh, uh, or looking at the uh, situation as uh, President Obama 
uh, uh, doing United States dirt, or he's, you know, succumbed to, uh, 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 you know, doing dirt. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, uh, just that's just another. Vi- I mean, codified. You talk about efficiency. The codified response would be Minister Farrakhan said what he said, and that would be that. <laughs> if you know, if it was just going to be locked code, that would be the codified response. Like not, because I mean, again, the problem is white people. It keeps. That's why I said just listen, because it keeps going back to non-white people. It keeps going back to you know. And Farrakhan is another victim by the example that you just shared. This you're mm. talking about someone who is not very powerful. Like, you know, Mm. a white person said that they were going to Mm. give him a billion dollars and some white people just, you know, got on the phone or wrote a letter. You know, there were no shots fired. I didn't hear that. But they just used some words and said no. And that's that. So we're obviously talking about someone who is not very powerful, a victim of white supremacy. Unfortunate, but that seems like, you know, that's what it is, according to your own evidence so i'm not going to keep going back and talking about someone who is not at the root of the problem i'm going to stay focused on who are these white people who denied him the money i don't hear their names mentioned in the story that's what i would much rather talk about i hear when that story goes down it's just Gaddafi did this Farrakhan did that who are the white people who intervened and said no what are their names what are their jobs how did they get this that's what i would much rather focus on so that's why I would prefer if, you know, if you are new to understanding white supremacy, uh, listening, just listen, just listen. Um, yeah, just just try listening for a little bit. Uh, if I said anything incorrect, you know, let me know. Does anybody know? No, that's white all I, well, well, I, I would say. Wait a minute. So, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Whoa. whoa, whoa, whoa. I was going to say. I was going to say one thing. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I wasn't. I wasn't even talking about you. I was talking about the other. The other. I'm using my mute button now, just to let folks know I am using my mute button. Um, go ahead, now, Mighty Wake. Oh no, I was just going to say that, that that sounds accurate. And I was going to say too that um, one thing to pay attention to because a lot of people do say say things, and so if this is a person. If a person is non-white, say like Farrakhan, for instance, or whatnot, and I think you know the caller mentioned that he was given a warning or uh, uh, something like that, or uh, to another non-white person, you know, uh, who was called the president at this time. You know, that's that's a uh, you got non-white people getting at another non-white person, you know, uh, prisoner getting at another prisoner, slave getting at another slave on the plantation. That's uh, that's, that's not that significant. You know that that should be should be looked at as you know that's to be expected, but you know white people are the, are the problem, so we got to try to connect with them. But ultimately, you know, you're going to be confusing yourself or confusing other people. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Um, I agree with with now mighty now mighty what just said. Uh, white people, they use tactics like that because uh, now white people, they'll spend a lot of time. Well, from what I understand on that, well, that story and that that um, so-called offer or whatever, I remember white people spending a lot of time uh, talking about that. It was all in the streets, you know, my uncle's a, a, a so-called Muslim. <laughs> and uh, I just remember that being discussed. A, a lot, and um, it never, you know, went back to white people that uh, during discussion of whether he was going to get this money or not, nobody ever said, you know, white people, um, you know, they they make the final decision um, on whether he get that money or not. And once you, it would have been done if that would have been said. It wouldn't have been talked. It's still talked about. I don't know how many years that that has been, and people still talk about that. I mean, it's crazy. Like that should have been over with, done with. Like if they say no, it's no. Now, you know, let's focus on the problem, and uh, you know, back to you know square one. Let's focus on the problem. We're not getting the money, okay? You know, our enemy is the dying it or whatever the case may be. The problem is white people that. It, it really annoyed me even back then. I was, I was, I was 
young, you know what I'm saying? I just was, was really annoyed by that conversa- conversation, that the fact that these grown people wasn't realizing that, like, you know, what the problem really was. <laughs> Even if you get a billion dollars, you still, you know, a slave. You still in a system of racism, white supremacy. And, um, yeah, I just find that a bit, I just disremember it that. I just find it just, it's upsetting, I guess. I'll just say it like that. Uh, <clears throat> South South Carolina, your line is open, and uh, D.C., I'm confused if you uh, have your line. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I can I can unmute your line, and then you can, you know, mute yourself, and then you can comment as need be. Um, and I'll just, I'll, yes. I'm, I'm going to mute yes. myself, I'm going to mute myself, and uh, then you all can have at it. I'll just comment so that people know, for me, this is a part of codification, um, the caller uh, the newer caller, uh, Khalil, uh, I am going to get you get your question, but this is what I mean about listening. Uh, I think for myself, I think it's very important when I started studying uh, codification and understanding the mechanics of how to discuss racism, white supremacy in a more precise manner. And I'm not perfect. I have a long way to go. I have not, you know, mastered that myself, but uh, I have been studying it for some time now. I've read Mr. Fuller's book. Um, You know, I've been studying it for some time now. Um, I did not have the ability to immediately respond. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's best to just listen. It's really best to just listen and pay attention to the way that words are being used, because a lot of this conversation is about words like, uh, you know, I cringe just on a word. Sometimes a word means everything. Uh, just saying the correct thing, not saying certain terms uh, is huge. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I think you'll pick that up just by listening. I'll mute my line and, you know, feel free, D.C. or whomever else. I would just say, you know, I, I had to go through, uh, it's not my look, I had to go through uh, a process. You know, when I first started uh, seriously studying racism and white supremacy, uh, you know, uh, just paying close attention to words and uh, what terms uh, to use and what makes the most sense to try to provide the most clarity for myself and for anyone listening to me, uh, whether it's at the time of the discussion or listening to it a year later. And so, I mean, um, I can guarantee I, I wasn't able to say jump right in and then just, you know, I automatically got it. And I'm still learning now. And so it's a learning process, too, because as far as I know, most non-white people, especially black people, um, at least for me, you know, it was, you know, coming up over the years, it was never a uh, focus. And I never had anyone uh, talk to me and say, hey, you need to be focusing on what you're saying, how you speak, orderly conversation, any of that. <laughs> you know, so a lot of that was brand new. And and, and I had to go so through a, a learning process uh, to get, you know, better at it, to be able to have these conversations be uh, more effective and uh, hopefully productive at uh, moving forward. Yeah, I'm, I was the same way. Um, I found the cows looking for audio on Nilly Fuller. And um, I listened. I was pretty codified at that point. I had read uh, uh, Nilly Fuller's book. I had read Dr. Wilson's book. Um, it made, it, it, it hit me kind of, I was, I was, um, I read it. It made sense. I was very. Um, I had read a lot of philosophy, a lot of a lot of different things. So it it made logical sense what uh, Mr. Fuller and Dr. Wilson was saying. Um, so I, I wanted to incorporate it. I realized that um, with them, you know, through my reading, that uh, just reading stories on people that were falsely uh, identified or classified as insane and being put in insane asylums. Soon becoming insane, being around so-called insane um, individuals. Uh, so I definitely understood that if I wasn't, if 
you know, if I was confused, I, it was a great, it, it was a possibility that I could confuse the people that was around me. And I didn't want to do that because uh, I knew how dangerous it is. And this is in this system, um, confusion is lethal. You know, a mistake, a simple mistake, and I've seen it thousands, I, I've seen it hundreds of times in Los Angeles where a simple mistake will get you killed, will get you, um, you know, put in prison, will lose, will get you lost of, of, of property and, and, and wealth. One simple mistake, just one simple mistake, and you will lose so much. So I definitely didn't want to um, be a tool uh, of life appearances and, 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 and a tool of confusion. That, 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 that's unacceptable for me. So, uh, yeah, I had to call, I had to call the fire real quick, and I was confident enough to call in, and, uh, I mean, I was confident in my call that I, I can hear myself, and I, I know what it is I'm going to say, because it's not, I say the same thing over and over again, it's not something that I'm just, you know, thinking on the spot, and I already know what it is. It's, I mean, it, it, from, uh, uh, from my, uh, you know, the conclusions that I've made, the problem, white people are the problem. I understand that. So, you know, when I called in, I had that understanding. So I, I, wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have dared call in if I didn't. I wouldn't have dared. Uh, that was my thinking. I have a question, um, Gus. Uh, whenever you unmute your line or if you feel like uh, elaborating on it, I just wanted to know if you thought for someone um, that maybe when they kind of uh, override when blacks need help or if someone wants to help or Ada, when they override it like that, maybe that perhaps other people have power, but we kind of belong to them, the white people, so that's why maybe um, they can just override whatever and call the final shot, it's kind of like with children, you know, you, the parent kind of uh, <laughs> makes the final decision. I just wanted to know your thought on that because I, I was just thinking that as we're uh, um, just going through the show and I'm listening to other people and different views and things. I just, if you remember when you unmute your line. Um, um, I guess, can you make it clear what you wanted me to elaborate on? Well, it was just, it's just my thought, and I'm merging thoughts here. Uh, I wanted to know if you thought, perhaps, maybe they do that on top of whatever else they do that for, because we kind of are their property, or we kind of belong to them, or they're kind of, you know, doing the ownership thing to say that, well, we have the final say on how what goes on with the Negroes. Uh, I, I don't. That just kind of came in my head, and I just wanted to know: Did I make? Was am I kind of gibbering, or am I confusing? Yes, yes I, I got. got I, I understand. Um, okay, thank. That uh, that makes sense. That makes sense. And yes, I, <clears throat> that I mean, that's the essence of the relationship. You know, is I mean, I'm, I'm, if you want to use that metaphor of a pet, yes, that's the essence of the uh, relationship. You know, uh, and you know, they. It's, it's not even that, really. I think Dr. Chen Weiss <laughs> said that uh, white people treat their dogs better than you know black people so i mean i can't even say it's really a, a pet but i mean yeah that that very much fits what's going on you know maybe maybe today you know i'll, I'll give my my pet negroes uh four servings uh maybe tomorrow i'll give them none you know that that is exactly what it is uh they are in charge and they make the decision i think you also said a parent and a child that's exactly i think mr fuller uses that metaphor often I, that's in the code book he says that uh white people are the parents that's why non-white people do not qualify as parents white people are the parents as long as white supremacy exists that's exactly the relationship you know white mother and white father will decide 
whether you can have that money. You know, we'll decide. We'll let you know when we come to a decision. Yes, that's exactly the relationship. We should all make sure we keep that in mind. I, I think a significant um, distinction, though, is that in a typical, uh, you know, I guess I'll use the word nurturing, correct parent-child relationship, the parent is attempting to uh, educate or provide for the child to a point to where the child can then, you know, be self-sufficient or dependent, uh, independent of the parent. And in this dynamic where you got white people functioning as illegitimate parents of the victims of non-white people, um, they are going to be making decisions, uh, whether it's denying billion dollars or even granting billion dollars to black people, whatever the case may be. Those decisions are going to be made based upon, and really just at that particular time, it may change in a week, but whatever they, whatever the racist man and racist woman determine would be best uh, for their interests, ultimately. You know, the interests of the white supremacists, ultimately. Uh, that's how those decisions are made, you know. Right, like in the end, they invest in themselves. Even if they get the billion, you know, right. they give black people a billion dollars. They doing that for so you be, be paying attention because it'll be for the ultimate reason of benefiting the white supremacists in the end. Not saying don't accept the money. Yeah, bring all the billions, but you know, just keep that in mind. That's you know, that's that's not for the purpose of uh, overthrowing white people. Meaning that's not the reason why they were giving it to us. You know, if they were to get it to. And as far as pets and, and whatnot, I know I've trained, uh, I've trained dogs, and you put it like a, you know, a piece of chicken on the floor, and you know it's done good, you know, for the dog and everything, and you make them, you know, you make them sit, you know, you make them not notice the chicken. You, you basically, it's, there's no boundary, you know what I'm saying? You don't have no rope on them, but you, it's your mastery or your control over them that. That you know you're not gonna eat that. I'm, I'm, I'm putting that there. It's on the floor. Uh, you know I don't know about the dog's intellect. I don't know if that dog understands that a person a person doesn't want to eat it off the floor. So uh, it's not for me. Why is it on the floor? Is it you know? It's not for the it's not for the human. It's for the what who what was the purpose of this chicken being on the floor? You know dogs eat off the floor and. You're stopping me from eating that. It's like uh, I just see that 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 similarity with uh, black people. It's like the training. It's like we will put this money out here. But no, you can't have it. You know, you have no access to it. Uh, I'm just basically training you, let you know who who's in control. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, that that extends into that's. You know, to adulthood, uh, once you have that that training, then they can kind of. Oh, it's like uh, I don't have to worry about my dog eating my food if I, you know, go to the bathroom or whatever. You know what I'm saying? He knows better. Mm. There's some other people that called in um, on the line. I wanted to just check to see if they had questions or comments. Um, Let's see, <laughs> Marcella. I remember Marcella. Uh, are you there, Marcella? <laughs> Hi. Um, I did have a question, but I wanted to listen to what everyone had to say. I know that we speak of this parent-child relationship, and we know that it's dysfunctional based on the conditions of this, this <laughs> let's say, illegitimate offspring. Um, how can that be remedied? Because even children who are in the most abusive relationship, is, I mean, abusive situation where they may have parents that abuse them both physically, mentally, um, how is that to be remedied? You know, at some point, you know, hopefully the, the, the abused child can, <laughs> even this sounds crazy, but the abused child could grow up and be a not autonomous of this and become um, an independent individual so I'm, I'm wondering, how does it relate? Is is it a remedy for this, or is this destined to cycle on and on and on? That that was my general question, if I'm making sense. That makes sense. 
that makes sense. My my view on it, I think it all ties together. It all goes back to what Dr. Chen Weezu said, and I hope you know people take that in. He's you know other side of the world from me, um, other side of the world. Uh, and he said most of the non-white people, black people that he's around, do not understand that we are at war with white people. And that's the case for me, too. I suspect that's the case for everyone on the planet. Most non-white people do not understand that. And that is a core part of ending that cycle. Um, you have to... People get accustomed to anything. And I think so many non-white people... I think Mr. Williams, I was listening to uh, Counter Racism Audio, and he said the effect that white supremacy has is that it makes the victims comfortable with this. Like, uh, you know, this is okay. You know, just to accept this relationship with white people, the way that they abuse us worldwide. And you have to... A big part of correcting that is getting the victims to understand this is incorrect. This should not be. We can do better than this. We can correct this problem. Uh, a big part of that is getting them to understand this is a problem uh, and then the process of how you correct that. That That is a big part. Even just working with so-called uh, traumatized children, uh, they get accustomed to that abnormal environment. A big part of correcting that problem is getting them to understand, hey, that was incorrect. What you had got accustomed to was totally incorrect and we should be doing something different. Getting them to understand that was, you know, not correct. This is the correct thing. This is what we should be doing. That's a big part of it. And I think that's 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 like the whole of everything with with where we should be putting our effort right now, getting people to understand that we are at war with these white people and some fundamental things need to change about the way we understand, think about, relate to white people. Thank you. Who's Dr. Chen? What's his first name? That's just that's just it. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, uh, that's it. Like, if you get his book, it's just it just says Chen Weezu. Um, yeah. If you put that in on, like, Amazon.com, it'll pop up. Um, the West and the Rest of Us, uh, Decolonizing the African Mind, it'll pop up. Okay. Gotcha. Or a library. Library, if you, you know. Uh, if you go to a good uh, university, college library, they should have, uh, they should have probably both of those. Um, the gentleman from Cleveland. Uh, uh, <laughs> get, I'm sorry, I guess I was going to ask you a question, but uh, you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'll get it. I'll get it. I was going to, I wanted to make sure I didn't forget uh, Cleveland because he said he had, I guess, I don't know if it was a question or a comment or what, but he had something he wanted to present. No, it was just a uh, quick uh, comment. This is something I wanted to share. Uh, I've been listening to this show for about uh, six months now. And I say I, I was wrong because I was a little more confused than I am now at the point that I started listening. But uh, this morning I work for a national organization. Um, and we have safety meetings every morning. And this morning's safety meeting was about wearing sunscreen. Now... I didn't think much of it. I will. I wouldn't have thought much about it six months ago, but it just it just reaffirms to me that um, we do live in a world of white supremacy. That's all. That's all. Replace it with justice. Sunscreen. That's <laughs> what. Uh, if you could tell us, like, where the demographics in terms of uh, where white people, non-white people, um, at the meeting. Um, it's uh, now white people and white people were at the meeting. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, uh, like I said, it's a national organization. Um, usually we talk about dog bites and, uh, things of that nature and suspicious packages. But, uh, this morning the meeting was about, um, sunscreen. <laughs> and, uh, at first I was, uh, 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 I was upset at first, <laughs> but, uh, listen to the show and, and, trying to be a little more codified about things. I asked the manager about it, and I asked her, what, what was this about? And quickly after I asked that question, she's a non-white female, uh, you know, numbered as uh, black. Uh, she disbanded the morning meeting after I asked that question, so. <laughs> wow. Wow. Right. Mm. Same thing I said. Mm. Wow. 
<laughs> that is fascinating. Yeah. What's it, the power of words? The power right. of words. I mean, just asking a question ended the whole me. What's incorrect about that question? I don't understand. <laughs> like, uh, wow. I, I, I was. I was at first. Like I said, I was. I was upset, but um. I, I had to understand what was going on, and I just got a chance to, and I, after that, I started asking all the uh, people who classify themselves as white, um, why do they tan? And no one could give me an answer, or wanted to give me an answer. Because I told them, I don't need sunscreen, I don't burn in the sun. But, I don't know, I'm still learning, I'm still learning. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me speak my piece. I'll still be listening. Sure. <laughs> Fascinating. Dr. Welsing would get a kick out of that, I am sure. Um, hmm. Uh, 909, did you want to shoot your uh, question? Oh, uh, yeah, I just think that I thought that was interesting what, uh, uh, the, uh, like the male just was saying right there. That was uh, interesting because I was thinking, I don't know if he was, I don't know if it was, you know, where he was he getting paid during that meeting, I suspect so. But, um, I mean, should black, should, uh, you know, black people in particular, non white people, should they have been uh, given a, a uh, you know, like a free, free, free time? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, we know this is not for you, so what we're going to do is, is we're gonna be preparing these white people, and we're we're, we're, we're uh, trying to tell them to wear sunscreen. And for for the black people, non white people that don't need sunscreen, we're gonna pay you and you know give you something more constructive to do with your time. But you know, like I said, you asking questions, then it brings out that you know we're we're talking. You know, we're this is focused on white people. We just have you sitting up in here. Uh, you know, confusing you, uh, you know, and, 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 and whatnot. So, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. I think it just goes back to, um, you know, the primary focus and the upliftment of white people. And the, the focus is white people. We're, we're, you know what I'm saying? Everything else is secondary. And if you don't ask, you're going to sit in here and be upset uh, because you like, this whole meeting is about, you know, white people, so-called white people. Why am I, what am I doing here? It's like, you're wasting my time. Nobody wants their time wasted. So you get upset and that stresses you out. And if you're, when you're stressed, your immune system gets lowered and, you know, it, it's a problem for you. I think that was that was good that you asked that question. It's like you know, but the only the, the, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry to cut you off. But the only thing that uh, about the whole situation that really really bothered me is that none of the other non-white people saw anything wrong with it. They didn't. They just they they just didn't see anything wrong with it. And just look at me as if you know, I know because I, I wear my hair naturally, big beard. Everything else uh, supposed to be against policy, but I think uh, fake hair is against policy and straight hair is against policy. So um, I don't know. I guess I don't know. Maybe they look at me like I'm different. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, they they don't. They're not aware. You know, they, they're not aware that time is being wasted. And uh, that's one. I was gonna, the question I was going to ask goes back to that. It's like I, I know. Uh, there's a there's a, a term that people say reality check, yeah. and I was just yeah. uh, you know what I mean reality check. So you, I don't know. It's just, it's just interesting when the uh, female caller was asking about you know the trauma or the abuse that that you go through and you know how it affects your life. And I, I've, I've noticed that people that have been through a severe you know abuse cases. When they get a reality check, when they realize, you know what, it wasn't my, you know, it was, even if the abuse came from the parent or whatever, or the so-called parent, it wasn't my mother, it wasn't my father, it was white people. 
it's like they clear up, man. They, they, if something happens to them, it's like a reality check. It's like, okay, this reality has partly cured me. I got a little bit more work to do, but just that reality check, man, it's like it just takes away so much of that abuse and trauma. I've seen it. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if anybody else is... Uh, I, was, I guess I just was wondering what that term meant to, you know, and, and to, to, to people and how they how, how they ever seen it uh, work uh, as far as abuse cases or, you know, trauma and whatnot. Once they understand the truth that white people are the problem, um, that's the cause of your, that was the cause of your trauma. That was the cause of your abuse and all the, every, every, your health problems, all of that stuff, the cause was white people. Like, uh, that, that understanding is a, is a healing factor. Are you, are you saying I identify, like, the original trauma? Because I think, you know, when you say the, being able to relate to your abuser, and even, I'm going to say, shucks, every, every African American here who are descendants of slaves are actually, um, if you look at originally uh, um, captives, more or less um, Stockholm syndrome, where you start to be able to relate and think that the, the person, the, the the group of people who are oppressing and abusing you, is actually doing you a favor. But are you saying that once you realize that yes, I have problems, but I'm not the root of those problems? Once you're able to identify the root, so you say you you have experienced a lifting of some type of weight that you was carrying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I've seen it myself. I've seen it in many, many, many other people that have understood that the problem, the white people are the problem. A weight, a, a, a huge weight is left. It. That is not me. It wasn't my parent. It wasn't my, you know, it wasn't, the, it wasn't my father leaving. It wasn't my father being an alcoholic. No, the problem of, of that, the cause of that was white people. And it brought families back together. I've seen the families back together. I've seen, I've just seen amazing effects of just that understanding. I have as well. Okay. I, I have as well. I, I I can yes, I have I have as well. Um, and in fact, um, Dr. Nancy Krieger. She is a doctor at Harvard University. John Henryism. Um, that somebody just brought that up recently. Um, white people have done research and they have shown that if you are a victim of white supremacy mm -hmm. and you attempt to ignore that fact and just work twice as hard as white people to get what you want to compensate for white supremacy, work twice as hard to do things, that is unhealthy and white people have postulated that that could be the reason that black people are suffering from hypertension, which is exactly what Dr. Wilson says too. Um, but they, I mean, this, white people have submitted this as a hypothesis, and it's called John Henryism. Uh, she came on this program. I'll upload that to talk to you. Uh, she came on this program, and she said it's not healthy uh, for non-white people to experience racism and not acknowledge and talk about that reality. It's not healthy. Um, she, that's what she does research on. So not only have I seen uh, examples where non-white people, once they get that understanding, uh, it do, I mean, just that alone is part of the healing process. Um, but white people have done studies uh, to say that not doing that is really harmful. Um, so, yeah, I've seen that. And, uh, yeah, I, I've seen that to be the case repeatedly. It helps you stop blaming yourself for things. I think so many non-white people experience so many problems uh, because of white supremacy. Once you get that information, it helps. It just helps bring clarity and it helps you to stop saying, oh, it's me. Or it just helps you to stop blaming non-white people. It helps you to point the blame where it should be placed. So the confusion stops. Okay. I, I won't say it stops, but it reduces. I think I think uh, it reduces uh, a tremendous amount of confusion. I think.
I think, and I could be wrong, somebody can correct me, but I think that um, black people, people of color, um, African Americans, however, however a, person will, a person of color like to identify themselves, spend an enormous amount of time trying to please white people and also um, internalize the idea of what's acceptable in, in that culture. And so what, what the gentleman said earlier speaks volumes because, you know, growing up, you're always told, well, you have to be twice as fast, twice as better, work twice as hard, and then you die twice as quick. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ponder on what he said for quite a while. I'm going to think about that, and I'm going to look up that, um, the Henry Syndrome that you speak of. I'll upload that uh, program, uh, Dr. Nancy Krieger. I'll upload it. I'll put it on the front page, so it'll be easy to find. Uh, but I mean, it all it it is up. I'll just I can also put the archives for the cows on my Facebook page because that is uh, you know you can you can get it right now. <laughs> um, yeah, it's online. Dr. Nancy Krieger. Uh, she was on in November of two thousand nine. Um, yeah, Cree was on that program too. Cree seven dot wordpress dot com. I think she pointed out where uh, Dr. Krieger was uh, most likely practicing. Right, she is a white person. I mean, uh, but yeah, I'm putting it on my Facebook page now. Uh, Facebook dot com okay. forward slash the problem is white people. I'm posting the link for the cows archives, and you can get uh, you can see all the the old walk talk programs. So this thing about trying to do something on a weekend, I think you said you had a safety meeting, was it today? And speaking up about something that you feel had nothing to do with your reality or why you guys were there. But the, um, the, I guess the majority of the group felt like their safety was, <laughs> was at risk because of the sun. I can say that I can relate that when you when, when I've been in a group where, I might, where it may have been um, a diverse group and speaking out and, and getting the... I guess getting the negative feedback and outright animosity from other other people of color in the group. I, I, w I would love for someone to, to kind of um, expand uh, expand this, but I, I think it's that old mindset that you're you're, ready, you're, you're a troublemaker. Why you want to go and say something? Or and I also think on the second hand that a lot of People of color have bought into this whole idea that they need to walk out with tons of sunscreen or they're going to have the same risk of getting, you know, melanoma and cancer as people who, who is not as highly melanated. It, it's amazing to me. DC, did you want your line open or are you uh, okay being muted? Oh, yeah. This is DC. This is DC Gus. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, getting back to how to be more codified in general for each program, instead of well, not instead of, but in addition to listening, I would suggest, which I did today. Um, I wasn't uh, available to talk because I was in a hotel lobby and I couldn't get to my hotel room, but now I'm here. Um, to have a pen and piece of paper and write down copious notes of everything that you are listening to. And if things that you don't understand, please write that down. Things that you do understand, please write that down too. So you can re reiterate to yourself that, um, okay, this is the issue. Am I understanding this issue? If I'm not clearly understanding it, I need to delve in further. But to try to stay more codified and how I maintain staying codified and having a codified life. For instance, um, I'll take today with Dr. Chimitsu, to, to Matsu. Um, I'd never heard of the man before, but um, in knowing that he is a victim of racism and this man has vast knowledge and has done his research, and I particularly picked up on the concept of war, the war concept system. Uh, uh, specifically because last night on the chat room we kind of touched on some of the concepts of war and weapons and things like that. But we didn't go too far in more than an hour in, in pretty much chatting about that. But anyway, when we brought that up, that was something that my brain computer targeted on. And now that I hear that information from Mr. 
um, Dr. Chimatsu, brain computer starts work. Let me repeat, the brain computer starts to work. And since I have a vast knowledge of the known universe and the so-called history of it, even though I didn't know the handbook beforehand, just by you and he um, conversing, doing question and answer, now I have a better understanding. So, knowing that I'm calling in and I'm listening to the program, and as usual, you cue the people who have called in, the guests, the callers have called in, if they have a question. So, then I say, if I've called in and I know this is going to happen, you're going to cue DC to ask a question or if I have a question. Now, the answer is no, not at the moment. I say not at the moment because I'm always, I always have questions. I'm a very skeptical person and I question everything. Or the second answer would be yes. If it's yes, then I should be ready with a question, period, end of discussion. <laughs> and um, I had a question because as he's talking, I'm going through my brain computer and I'm thinking what group of people have had to successfully conquered uh, white supremacy races, not successfully completely, but at least they could say, well, we've done our part. We've done this, you know, deliberately and consciously, and we came together as a people to do it. And the first thing I thought was Ethiopia. So hence, I asked the question about Ethiopia. And, um, and I'm so glad that he answered it and had vast knowledge about it, and I took away with that knowledge. So... In closing, I would say it's best to, to for every caller that calls in, for anyone who com comes on in the chat room, to at least have a pencil and paper notebook. If you have photographic memory, good for you. I don't. I have to write everything down. Um, and make sure you document these things and don't let things waste away because your, your, your brain computer sometimes can become you know, overloaded and you might forget. So it's always good to use this information as if this is school, this is education. Mr. Fuller had said at one point, uh, the universe is, um, is your university. And when he said that, my brain computer went haywire. And I, I'm like, wow, universe, university, that makes sense. But then without a step, he also said, but this could be a prison at the same time, I don't want to go in prison. I don't want to be imprisoned. So I use this universe as my university. And coming here on your show and um, discussing with other non-whites these issues, and we don't want to get into the, into the routine of just going in circles. We're trying to move you know, strategically forward, never backward. And to, to solve these problems. And sometimes I think, you, you know, we have to combine all of the strategies and the listening and the hearing and being observant at the same time and never letting those observations, you know, go, um, uh, you know, under the water, so to speak. Um, and just keep moving. And then when you see things on paper, and for me, I have to see it on paper. It's almost like a war plan. I have to see things on paper in order to get moving in order to kind of solidify my action, so to speak. Getting back to, you know, and the other callers in California have said, you know, it's about thought, speech, and action, and I totally agree. <laughs> That's my religion. That's the only religion, religion that I adhere to. I don't, you know, adhere to Christianity or any other religion. I adhere to common sense, logic, and thought, speech, and action. So in, in closing, basically, we need to come here and treat this form as school, as education, and document this so we can continue to ask more questions and refine those questions, and questions upon questions, in order to, you know, uh, go through solutions. And yesterday on the chat room, um, you know, I, someone said, um, you know, you have to kind of use, uh, like, Bruce Lee tactics, you know, well, Bruce Lee's going to lose because if, if he gets an uh, AK-47 or whatever, he's going to lose. But basically, you have to understand Bruce Lee's philosophy. What is his philosophy? Don't just say just Bruce Lee. What is his philosophy? What made Bruce Lee the man 
that changed the world. That was quoted in um, in a, a documentary on the History Channel. Why, how did that one Asian, non-white man change the world? Every culture recognizes this. This man has statues everywhere. And he didn't set out to change the world. He went through the process of learning, kind of doing, you know, he learned from, um, uh, I saw this movie called Ip Man. That's uh, I-P Man, A-P-A-M-A-N. And this man taught him basic concepts of a martial art. That Bruce Lee's like, wow, that makes sense. He's using economy in his moves. He's not boosting any moves. That makes sense. And then Bruce Lee went and he studied. He studied how to take care of his body. And he studied how to do um, better moves, more economical moves. So I think for every individual, we have to get into that mindset for ourselves first. And then, you know, share this knowledge as in this forum, which I, I really thank you for, you know, having the bravery. This is, this is brave work, guys to allow us to get together. And you have no fear. You, you let everybody call in. You let everybody speak um, and treat this as education. This is school, people. This is war and this is school. And that's my thought. Um, one thing I did want to get in, um, woo, buddy, 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 my cowbell, uh, would have been ringing because, uh, victim of white supremacy, Bruce Lee also married a white woman. Um, and. Oh, I, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> no, I didn't forget about that. Um, the other thing I want to get in, he has statues everywhere except on the campus of the University of Washington. And the only reason that that is significant is because Bruce Lee is an alum at the University of Washington. And uh, I know some people who are less confused about white supremacy who thought, you know, that is astounding. How can that be um, that he doesn't have a statue here? And they went to talk to white people and, uh, you know, White supremacy. <laughs> White supremacy is why he doesn't have a statue uh, on the campus of the University of Washington. And just to put that in perspective, they have statues of they have statues of white people on that campus who didn't even attend the university. Didn't even go there. Not, you know, particularly famous, much less significant than Bruce Lee. And they have statues of them. And the reason that the statue is there for at least one of them, I was told, was so that white people from a particular area of the world could relate to the campus better. So, you know, Bruce Lee has no statues there. He married a white person. I was singing the cowbell in the background. But yeah, I think those are, uh, I think those are excellent uh, suggestions around taking notes um, and just trying to refine as we go. Everyone, you know, myself included, refining questions. And uh, if this, you know, war is serious and we are serious about strategies, then uh, just coming prepared to be serious and, and dialogue. I think that is outstanding. Um, yeah, I, and I, I did. Oh, I'm glad you brought up the war aspect. One thing I have noted, because there's so much confusion amongst non-white people, that anti-blackness that the recent caller brought up, uh, there's so much anti-blackness even among black people, it's really difficult to get into a serious discussion about counter-violence because our tendency is to be violent with one another. I've just seen that repeatedly. And if you do not have, I mean, it has got to be no doubt about it. I mean, you got to know instinctively the problem is white people that is the enemy this is war against white people and that's not our instinct right now uh, until I think he said that on the program we walk through the world as if we have no enemies and if we do it's another non-white person so until that is corrected and I mean like 99.9% .9 of victims in my opinion are afflicted with this so until that's corrected it's gonna be real <laughs> It's going to be dangerous for us to even get into counterviolence because it's just going to end up boomeranging back on us, unfortunately. I've seen that repeatedly.
Yeah. Yes, I agree. Definitely. I agree with that. It's weird because I actually have Bruce Lee under <coughs> under the, under John Henry as well. Uh, I I got some notes that I wrote, and uh, I've I've got some of uh, Bruce Lee's books on uh, Wing Chun and, and all of that, and I I concluded that he was a victim of John Henry as well. They have a docudrama about his life, you know, which is not accurate. But even in the docudrama, they have a scene where he is having a tantrum because of white supremacy. And he is yelling and saying, these white people are mistreating me. They have tons of scenes where white people, ab white people abusing him on the campus of the University of Washington. Tons of scenes. I mean, ugh, that could be I mean, another probably brilliant case study in racism, white supremacy, Bruce Lee. And he married, I totally and I highly suspect that John Henryism. If we think John Henryism contributed to his early departure, how much of that do you think is because he married a white woman? That's part of it. But yes, his 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 high work ethic, his high principles, pretty much probably stressed them. Maybe. So much that, of course, he had a brain aneurysm and, you know, killed him. But, yeah, I would say, yeah, he, he suffered from, from John Henryism. So, yeah, and I also recommend... Um, Yes, the Bruce Lee book on the the uh, the Wang Shang um, martial arts, and basically it's his code book, his version of his code um, that he developed along with the past um, martial arts that he had learned from you know his uh, martial arts teacher, and he saw every time his brain computer went off, he's like, hmm, I'm gonna add boxing to this. Hmm, I'm gonna act like water. Hmm, I'm going to act like, you know, the tiger. I'm going to be the tiger. And it's like he, he took natural elements and he just looked and they observed and he put that in his code. And I try to do that as much as possible. <laughs> but um, and I, I'm, I, don't, I don't practice martial arts, but I read that book just because I wanted to understand the nature of codification on other realms, you know, not just in the Lee Fuller's um, book, not, not just in um, Dr. Wilson's book, it, it, I mean, I just wanted to understand how this man changed the world and his, his, his codification with his work ethic. Now, you know, we're going to disagree about him marrying a white woman, and I'm, I'm going to disagree with that, too. But, <laughs> um, but I, I'm just, I just admire his process of thinking and how he just, you know, there's a pebble in the pond, and it just, Radiated to all the different aspects of how we needed to get better at it. We need to do that for all the nine principles, period. Today, I focus mostly on the war aspect, but that's what the call is not wrong. The call didn't just talk about war, he talks about all of them. But I particularly picked up the war part because maybe my brain computer was thinking of that since yesterday, but we all need to have, you know, a focused um, procedure on how we do each and every principle. So maybe, you know, in, in future broadcast, we could focus on one principle and how and ask a tremendous amount of questions. Come with the, to the program with 10 questions. Two, you know, two questions a piece for each person, and we would, you know, we discuss how we can basically, you know, get to the next level with those questions. What actions should we take? Now, just like, when I came on about my work issues, Gus went at it. Any constructive crit um, critiques, comments? That's how you do it. That's how you do it. And I, and I took notes, and I'm, I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it. With this critical thinking... I'm going to ask. Go ahead. I'm, 
Yeah. Oh, um, I was just going to say that um, the, the, the question I had about the Ethiopians being able to say, to proudly say, nonetheless, because that's every new Ethiopian person that I meet, because they gravitate towards me, because I'm not with the Ethiopian, but I'm not. Um, they say, oh, we've never been conquered by the white man. We've never been conquered. And I'm like, give me more information. <laughs> How do we keep that going? How do we stop being conquered? You know? And that's, that's me trying to understand, okay, if it's been done before, you know, it can be done again. Okay, don't, don't, don't just say that white people are, you know, they do what they do. I don't want to hear that. But, you know, we stop accepting mistreatment. And it's now time to be brave about trying to replace it with something, you know, like justice, perhaps? Better treatment? That's mm. all. I'm sorry. I did want to make sure I got in. Um, I have some familiarity. I am ignorant. Uh, I do not think it is correct to say that so-called non-white people in the area of the world known as Ethiopia, uh, I do not think it's accurate to say that they are not, have not been subjected to the system of white supremacy. I do not think that is correct. And in fact, uh, I have met some of those, you know, non-white people, so-called Ethiopians who, you know, boast about having never been conquered by white people. And I think that is a sad illustration of confusion. Uh, I just want to make sure that is on record. A sad illustration of confusion. I think it may, you know, be somewhat further accurate to say, too, that I think um, the guest today said, said the word uh, defeated or the question was asked in the term of Ethiopian uh, or you know, non white people there uh, defeating, um, I guess, white people. I mean, I think it was a case of they won a battle, you know, but then, you know, some other white people came through and, you know, they're still doing a war, you know, still war. And so, yeah, um, and they're still victims, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I think they would say they're, they're still victims, but. They want to hold on to, you know, the uh, title of not successfully being colonized by England. That's, that's pretty much it. I would, I would agree with you guys about, you know, they're, they're, yeah, they are confused, but they want to hold on to that. But there's something, you know, we all should be turning to say, okay, all right, well, if it didn't work there, let's refine it, make it better, make it so that it won't happen again. Somehow, you know, I, I don't, I don't ever want to bow down to defeat. So, I want, I want to know as much as possible where it's been, you know, at least attempted and um, somewhat successful. Um, so it can be refined to be better to get to the best result. I think Mr. Fuller had said that one time, I've listened to so many of his podcasts, um, he would say, there's a good way to do things, there's a better way to do things, and there's a best way to do things. You know, you have to try to get to the best. It's, and, you know, it's, it's, it's fine to try to attempt to do the good, the better, the best, but at least try to do our best. At the end of the day, okay, it might be good, but okay, take it. Because tomorrow, you're going to try to do your best tomorrow. I'm going to mute myself for the remainder of the program. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, and 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific. Uh, R.N. Bradley, she'll be on the program. Uh, she's at uh, Florida State. Um We'll be uh, discussing some of her essays on white supremacy. She seems less confused. Black female, uh, she seems less uh, confused uh, about white supremacy. Uh, we shall see uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific. And uh, Umar Abdullah Johnson, he'll be here on uh, so-called Memorial Day uh, this Monday, same time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific. Um, I did want <clears throat> to 
rewind uh, because uh, the caller, she was talking about taking notes, uh, and I had uh, my notes for the program. Uh, Dr. Ken Wizu, uh I asked him about it on the program, and he elaborated. Uh, black people have been losing nonstop in this war against white people. We have been losing nonstop for two or more millennia. Uh, that sounds like, uh, unfortunately, defeat. Uh, I will mute my line. The people, uh, the person that called in, B, B Rasta, B H Rasta, your line is open. And uh, Khalil, I will open your line up in seven minutes. Uh, if you have a question, I'll open your line up. Uh, I'm muting myself uh, for the remainder of the program. Hello? Hello. Okay. Um, first time caller um, to the towels. Um, I am a non-white person, non-white male. Um, from the back area of the world known as the, the Caribbean. Um, I have found this program to be most constructive. Uh, first, in my understanding of um, racism, white supremacy, what it is and how it works. And, um, you are mu you are unmuted. Point, but um, I will continue to listen. Thank you. I have a question. I'm from uh, Washington D.C. Um, many I have many friends who are from the West Indies, and of course, the West Indies, no, or the Caribbean, um, suffering from white supremacy racism, of course, because um, we're all speaking English. Uh, and nations such as Jamaica um, and Trinidad, Tobago, and um, Haiti, and it seems like, okay, yes, these countries basically are not my people, and they have the majority, and they have majority rule and everything, and how... Do you think that, um, like, the policies uh, in terms of, like, um, of, um, when <laughs> the white man, so to speak, who colonized the Caribbean and brought African slaves over, how do you think they uh, adapted to that um, after the so-called white rule or the yeah, white rule left the Caribbean? But do you, what, what is your opinion on it or experience? Um, I would say that, um, in my own thinking, my own words, um, white rule had not ended. Um, I just think, well, what, um, what has happened is that it nearly had an exchange. Um, I can more position this or think of this as being um, allowed out of one plea, out of one plea, out of box and being put into a larger one. Yeah. Um, Non-white people in this part of the world, um, I could speak um, specifically about Trinidad and Tobago because that's where I'm from. Um, I think the entire movement if you would call it the independence movement, the independence movement in the, in the Caribbean, which happened um, during the 1960s, um, it was a successful, I would call it a psychological, uh, a, a psychological tool mm -hmm. by um, the racist white supremacists to misdirect or to fool the non-white people into thinking that um, they had some, uh, or we had some um, say, or think that we would be given some type of say into our determining our destiny, our fate. And uh, by and large, I think that um, psychological, uh, psychological tool weapon has worked. Because you have non-white people 
in this part of the world thinking that um, I will find it very difficult to agree with you or to agree with anyone that um, that racism is a problem that it does exist and that it is something that they should focus their efforts towards fighting and eliminating. Is it because Trinidad and Tobago is um, the majority are, are now white black people? Is that is that the case? Yes, I would so I would um, suggest that that would be the case. Um, the mere fact that we do not interact with um, racist white supremacists directly um, yeah. has contributed to that to that um, belief. Um, that we are being devastated by racist white supremacists by way of policy. Um, that's why uh, it would have resonated when Gus was speaking earlier on about IMF. Mm -hmm. I could, could even add um, institutions such as the World Bank, um, United Nations, who rule by proxy. Uh, rule by policy and they control and manipulate the destinies of non-white people without non-white people being aware of it. Hmm. So would you say that it would be indirect instead of di direct? Definitely. Yes. Okay. Definitely. And I think the, the indirect method has been largely successful. Wow. Okay. One question about um sure. patois. <laughs> I'm very I'm very mm -hmm. intrigued by patois. My patois imitation sucks, so I'm not even gonna try it. But okay. I've been told that patois was basically um practiced to basically be the code amongst non white people. Is that true? Um, I would say that there is some truth to that. Um, it has, it has worked, um, okay, um, okay, it has been said. Define Patois um, first, please. I would say that, um, Patois, I, I understand Patois, I would define Patois as, um, not just a broken, well, if it, if your majority language or if, if, if the mo most popular used language let's say in Trinidad is English, then you will define a patois as a broken English in where you would um, deliberately shorten or you, well, essentially you would shorten the use of some words, shorten the length of some words, um, but um, the speaker or the and listener would understand that, they would understand the meaning of that word, would understand the full context of how the word is but someone who is not initiated would not. So, for, um, I would say basically you could think of it as broken English. If your majority language is French, then it will it would be a broken French. So it um yes, yeah, I would say I would that is my understanding of my um, patois, which will be separate and apart from what I would call a, a dialect. And I would define a dialect as, um, well, a, a dialect would evolve out of, um, I would say, a dialect would be more creative because it is um, actually a re a, an invention of terms or of words that, that previously would not have existed. So it becomes a dialect will be more localized to that part of that region of the Caribbean or, you know, from where you are from. I don't know if that, I don't know if that is clear. No, that's, that's clear to me. That's okay. Clear. I, I mean, um, yeah, I, I see it as a way that people basically use that as the code language to basically, you know, not have um, the white supremacists understand exactly what you're doing <laughs> or saying yes. or going to do. So that's, that's yeah. one version of having a code, in my opinion. It's a, to me, it's a language because other people are, are able to understand it. Yes. 
So whether it's called dialect or not, other people that that are able to understand it, it's a language. (laughs) Yes. I have made an an observation um, before, like uh, in conversation, um, for, for instance, like you would have white people would be coming to the Caribbean as tourists or as, you know, in what, other, in what capacity. We are very curious about dialect in particular. In mm-hmm. fact, they would go so far as to encourage you to speak what you call a standard English or what they refer to as standard English so that they, it is always important for the white people to understand what you are saying at all times. Mm-hmm. So they would find dialects to be, they have found dialects to be of interest because, I mean, it is my, I would conclude that um, the dialect, given that you can speak or non-white people can have conversation and white people not know what is, what they are, what is, what is being said, um, I probably would think that they would see that as a, as a threat. Yes, it is. They would, I would yeah. agree. I would yes. definitely agree. Because they would encourage you to speak in a way that they understand. Yeah. Mm. I agree. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Trinidad. Thank you. <laughs> I, I have no further questions. I did say uh, IMF is a cowbell from now on. Mm-hmm. And World Bank. And World Bank, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because they are indirectly, indirectly raping Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados, Bahamas, all of them. Everybody. Oh, yes. Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee. <laughs> In fact, um, I recently learned that um, most um, most countries or most of the states of the Car- of the Caribbean would have secured um, development loans or development grants to the IMF, sponsored by the World Bank. And we would use that to build schools, build up infrastructure, and um, to do to undergo um, to fund your development, to, to fund your education, and um, the terms and conditions. Because all these they, they do they do come with their own conditionalities, and uh, part of the conditionality is that, for instance. You cannot, um, you can't even name your school. You can't give the school a name of your choosing. And you can't do that for up to and including at least 20 to 25 years. And, uh, in fact, it's, you cannot change, you cannot make a structural change. In fact, you can't put up so much as a classroom onto a school until that 25 years which will normally be the, the length of time that you would um, have to take, you would have taken to pee off that iron muffler. Cool. I have one more question. What constructive sure. thing um, have you seen in Trinidad in, in particular um, that seems constructive um, that the government has done, that in your opinion, that's been constructive or your observation? Do you think there has been or... Okay, um, toward what end? Any particular Anything area? Anything in, in healthcare, for instance. Let's take healthcare. What's going on with healthcare? Two minute warning. Well, two minute warning. Healthcare. Okay, two minute warning. Okay. I'm going to stop talking and go. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, well, I would say um, now. Governments in the Caribbean are still in, in a, the phase of um, constructing or putting up infrastructure, new schools, um, more hospitals, um, trying to invest. But um, like everything else, it is limited by what the white supremacists allow. 
because you still have to go back and apply for fresh loans. And um, they still, as long as they set the conditionalities, they set conditionalities for development. So it is constructive. Constructive things are taking place, but it is only what the white sponsors would allow. Yeah. Really noted. I understand. Okay. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, I'm done with the questioning. <laughs> okay. Can I um, ask a question um, to guys? Yes, sir. Um, well, sometime I have, um, I sent a text for with a guest suggestion, um, Dr. Claude Anderson. Um, I want to ask if probably you had an intent to consider or to be in contact with um, Dr. Anderson to probably feed him as a possible guest. I uh, contacted him uh, last year about being a guest, and at the time he was not able. But, uh, you know, it's been a year since I made a pitch, so I will ask again. Um, and that has worked uh, before, um, where some people just asking a little later, they, uh, things have changed, they now have time. So I'll ask again and see what he says. Thank you. No worries. No worries. Um, I would love to, uh, you know, focus on racism, white supremacy in all areas. So uh, if you... Uh, know of folks or if you yourself would be interested in uh, sharing views on racism white supremacy in your area specifically I'm sure a lot of listeners they would you know appreciate that information um, you can shoot me an email and uh, yeah that would be that would be great to, uh, to get that information yes I'll be interested oh, sorry go ahead no that was it but at any point in time, um, sure, I would be interested. Okay. Uh, yeah, just shoot me an email uh, until justice at gmail dot com, and uh, yeah, I would. Uh, I'd very much be interested in getting getting that information. World system. I think that is super important in grasping world system. Uh, justice. Uh, yeah. Um, Gus, uh, have you, um, figured out any acronyms? No, ma'am. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, me neither, but, uh, yeah, um, if, again, if, uh, anybody, uh, figured out in any, um, well, if anybody, uh, made up, um, any acronyms, uh, please, uh, email me, uh, at, uh, justice, uh, dot, rwswj at gmail.com and um, I would uh, really be looking forward uh, to um, seeing uh, those acronyms. We'll be back tomorrow. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cows signing out. Thank you.